welcome to our September 7th board business meeting. Welcome to our board members, MCPS staff, and members of our community who are joining us here today, and to those that are watching the meeting via live stream. Now let us begin by standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I will call roll to recognize board members to establish that we have a quorum. Mr. Saeed? Hello, everybody. Sammy Saeed, student member of the board, and I'm thrilled to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. Lynn Harris, at-large member, and I use she, her pronouns. Good afternoon. Welcome back to school. I'm Rebecca Svondrowski, District 2. Good afternoon. Shebra Evans. Good afternoon. Brenda Wolf, District 5. <laughs> Good afternoon, buenas tardes, Grace Rivera Oven, District 1. Good afternoon, Julie Yang, District 3. Welcome back to school. Now we can begin the meeting with the approval of the revised agenda. Move mm -hmm. approval. Can I get a second? Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Okay, so now we're moving on to agenda item number three, the Human Resources and Development, the monthly report. Dr. McKnight. Thank you. I move forward the monthly Human Resources and Development report for approval. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Thank you. I do have a resolution that I would like to share. Whereas the death on July 24th, 2023 of Mrs. Marilyn Katz, classroom teacher at Carter Rock Springs Elementary School has deeply saddened the students, staff, and members of the Board of Education. During the 11 plus years Mrs. Katz worked for MCPS, she provided individualized support and demonstrated sensitivity to her students. Mrs. Katz established consistent procedures in the classroom and maintained a calm voice both of which encouraged a positive atmosphere. She consistently served as a positive role model for her students. Mrs. Katz regularly motivated and encouraged her students, which resulted in student participation during lessons and consistent work completion. Mrs. Katz was supportive of her teammates and worked well with all stakeholders in the school community. Now therefore be it resolved that the members of the Board of Education and the Superintendent of Schools express our sorrow at the death of Mrs. Katz and extend deepest sympathy to her family. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that's unanimous. Okay, now we're moving on to agenda item number four. Dr. McKnight. Thank you. I do have one resolution acknowledging Hispanic Heritage Month. Whereas Hispanic Heritage Month celebrates the, history, the histories, cultures, and contributions of residents living in the United States who trace their ancestral roots to Spain, Mexico, and Spanish-speaking countries of Central America, South America, and the Caribbean. <clears throat> Explorers from the Iberian Peninsula traveled the Chesapeake Bay area during the early 16th century. Hispanic people of multiple nationalities began to migrate in large numbers to Montgomery County during the 1950s and 1960s, as well as the 1980s and 1990s. Montgomery County has one of the largest and most diverse Hispanic populations, and Hispanic students make up the largest student groups in Montgomery County public schools. Hispanic traditions are integral to Montgomery County's identity for both Hispanic and non-Hispanic people. Hispanics have made valuable contributions to the United States, including culture, government, military service, economics, sports, the arts, education, and numerous other distinctions. Montgomery County Public Schools is committed to partnering with students, parents, guardians, and community members to ensure that we provide welcoming and affirming experiences for both families and students. MCPS is committed to providing equitable, accessible, and culturally relevant learning experiences for Hispanic students so that they can thrive academically, emotionally, and socially. Therefore, be it resolved that the Montgomery County Board of Education, the Superintendent of Schools, hereby declare September 15th through October 15th, 2023, to be Hispanic Heritage Month and encourage staff, students, 
parents, guardians, and community to actively honor the cultures and contributions of Hispanic people in Montgomery County, the state, and the nation. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that is unanimous. Thank you. And I am um, following the lead of the former board member, Judy Daca, by wearing my Guatemalan uh, jacket today, since <laughs> that is my, my heritage. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, our next item on the agenda is public comments. Public comments is one of our opportunities to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. Board members will take your comments into consideration, but it's not our practice to take action at this time on issues that are raised. We encourage public input on policy, program, and practices. This is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters, so we encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. This is a public meeting, and we expect the conduct of all speakers and members of the audience to be within the bounds of proper etiquette. Inappropriate personal remarks, rude retorts, or other such behavior is out of order and will not be tolerated. Those who demonstrate disruptive or disrespectful behavior during public meetings, the public comments may be asked to leave the room. Please check our website for information about upcoming board meetings, hearings, and work sessions, including any changes to our meeting start times. We have six people signed up to provide in-person testimony. Each speaker will receive two minutes for comments. Actually, I think we have a few more because we had a few walk-ins since the start of the meeting. When your name is called, please approach the table. Speak clearly and directly into the microphone. 30 seconds prior to the expiration of a speaker's time, a yellow light will go on, accompanied by a beep. A red light and a buzzer signals that your time has expired. Please push the flat button below the microphone to turn it on and begin speaking. Push the same buttons once more at the sound of the buzzer to turn it off. In addition to our in-person in speakers today, we have three people signed up to provide video testimony. We will play these submissions once the in-person testimonies have concluded. Copies of testimonies can be found on board docs where they are posted for, uh, with other materials for this meeting. If we could have our first three speakers please come forward. Jennifer Jones, Daniel Wobishet, and Lee Blind Blinder. Jennifer Jones, you may begin. Good afternoon. I'm speaking today about two topics. The first is updates on school construction for renovations and additions. The second is mental health agencies contract renewals to allow students to continue receiving therapy at school. From 2017 to 19, I spoke about Lake Seneca's need for renovations and the addition to the building. Attached are my three previous testimonies. I'm again asking that Lake Seneca be placed back onto the list. Our school was on the list several years ago. Our community met with the architects and finalized the design. Our school was later removed from the list and we haven't received further consideration. This is our second year as a Title I school. Our class sizes continue to dictate the need for more space. The staff we have been assigned has grown to meet student needs. As a result, we continue to lack space to provide various supports we are required to implement. We continue to, do, to use nine portable classrooms and many staff continue to share space resulting in a multitude of negative impacts. We cannot continue to squeeze our students and staff into our school that needs many repairs. Please return us to the list of schools receiving funds for renovations and additions. The second topic is the critical need for ongoing mental health supports for our students. As an elementary counselor, I've spoken to you 12 times about the need for a lower elementary school ratio. Only half of our elementary schools have more than one counselor. As a result, we have partnered with agencies referring many students who receive therapy at school. I was told by Frederick Behavioral Health Partners therapists that MCPS has not renewed their contract. They are not allowed to see our students for sessions in our school at lunch during the school day as they have done so for many years. This is a huge concern, especially for students who have developed critical therapeutic relationships. Meanwhile, MCPS has invited our school to work with JESA to house a therapist four days per week to work with students. Our students who currently see therapists from other agencies must still be allowed to meet in our school. We need MCPS to sign the contract with FBHP and other agencies immediately. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel? 
Good afternoon, uh, Dr. McKnight and members of the board. Uh, I am a resident of Montgomery County, an Ethiopian-American lawyer, and proud parent of two sons. My pronouns are he, him. I'm a cisgender straight man and a very strong ally of the LGBTQ plus community. I'm here on behalf of the Coalition for Inclusive Schools and Communities to urge the board to continue supporting LGBTQ affirming curriculum in our schools and of course reject calls for opt-outs from such curriculum. I want to highlight three quick points. Number one, an inclusive curriculum allows all students to develop sympathy and understanding of differences in our communities. These are core values that help prevent bigotry and intolerance and continue, that continue to endanger LGBTQ folks in, in various parts of the world. For example, in Ethiopia, it's still a crime to be a homosexual and imprisoned with 15 years imprisonment. In Uganda and other places, they are actually introducing and have introduced the death penalty for LGBTQ individuals. Education about and, and, and um, affirmation of our LGBTQ neighbors, classmates, and colleagues are the tools that help these draconian laws and societal attitudes. Number two, our children who are fortunate to live in a diverse, welcoming, and uh, progressive community such as Montgomery County should not be outcasts and impeded in their education, careers, and lives. They need to have the option uh, to have exposure and also be able to live with and understand about individuals who are LGBTQ. Last but not least, I also want to send a message of affirmation and hope to all LGBTQ students, especially Ethiopian American, other fellow African and Muslim students, that we hear you, we love you, we care about you, and we affirm you wholly and unreservedly. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Lee Blinder or Blinder? Linder. Linder. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. McKnight, President Sylvester, uh, Vice President Evans, members of the board, and esteemed guests. My name is Lee Blinder. I use they, them pronouns, and I'm the executive director of Trans Maryland. In addition, I am honored to be a co-chair of the Coalition for Inclusive Schools and Communities with my esteemed colleagues. It has come to my attention that I'm one of a very small number of openly transgender adults who have testified in front of the board, and I'm proud to do so, even if my presence is a source of discomfort to others. I am also an MCPS alum, and I graduated in the year 2000. I did not have an easy time in school, and I was bullied regularly. To anyone here or who is listening to this later, and especially to the young people for whom the world is not yet making a space for, I understand. I lived a childhood where I did not belong, and yet through the support of the other kids who did not fit in, and frankly, thanks to books and libraries, I made it to adulthood. I volunteered in the library as a student because it was my safe space, full of books that allowed me to escape into worlds where being different was an asset, not a liability. I want to tell the parents who are afraid for their children's, young be uh, their children's well-being that we will protect your young children from harm, that they will not be bullied for being different like so many of us were, that they will graduate into a world that uplifts them for who they are. But that is not true. They will unfortunately inherit the work of liberation that we are unable to complete. What I can tell you is that affirming your child is the best way to ensure that they make it to adulthood. You'll hear in testimony uh, later on today why that is so important. We have the unique opportunity to seek understanding and to heal across our differences. Remember, our children are watching and are learning how, from us how to handle conflict and how to seek restorative healing. Thank you. Thank you. If we could have our next uh, three speakers please come forward. Kelly Fuentes, Dee White, and Jennifer Martin. Okay, Jennifer Martin is not here. Is that correct? No? Okay, so uh, we could have uh, Zaim Bay come forward. And um, Kelly Fuentes can begin.
Hey everybody, my name is Kelly Fuentes. I have two kids in MCPS. One child is in Crest Haven, the other child is in second grade at Roscoe Nix. As you know, Roscoe Nix follows the innovative school calendar and its partner school, Crest Haven, does not. I would like to share my experience with this program. It has become increasingly difficult to manage two different schedules for my children, both of whom are within the MCPS system. The ISY program has been affecting the well-being of my youngest child. My child at Nix is overwhelmed and in need of a break. I'm hearing the same thing from other Nix parents. Our children are having meltdowns, faked illnesses, tears, and screams of how unfair this is that their, children is, their siblings are getting a true summer break and that they are not. It has affected my family personally in that we are unable to take vacations and have flexible summer plans. However, I am aware that there are varying degrees of summer opportunities within my community. An optional program that provides flexibility for families, students, and teachers, such as ELO Sale, might be better revisited for next. Additionally, I'm concerned about the high burnout rate in education, let alone a primary school that has an additional 25 to 30 days. As we all know, teachers are required for pre-service and setting up their classrooms, further cutting into their summer breaks. If teachers are experiencing burnout, it will trickle down to the students. You cannot pour from an empty cup. My understanding is that there are program studies that I have not seen, but shows little progress overall. Even though this is my daughter's last year at Nix, I feel like I can be a voice for those families who may not know how to advocate concerns regarding the mandated ISY. I urge you to carefully and strongly reconsider this program for the support and well-being of your students, family, and staff. Thank you all. Thank you. D. White? Good afternoon. One more Dr. time. I think it didn't turn on. Sorry. Here you go. Good afternoon, Dr. McKnight, Ms. Silvestri, and fellow members of the board. My name is Dee White. I am a teacher at Roscoe Nix Elementary School, a primary school pre-K to second grade. My principal, Ms. Folks, AP, Mrs. Madon, counselor, Ms. Jerry Grau, Ms. Taylor, and Ms. Diggs are dedicated to go above and beyond for me. Nix family, I love you. During my tenure at the school, I have had the opportunity to work both ELO Sale 2013 to 2018 and the Innovative School Calendar 2019 to present. The ELO Sale program gave me the opportunity to reinforce previous student learning and differentiate learning for students who were showing exponential growth to get a head start for the upcoming school year. Students and teachers really enjoyed being there because they had a choice to either be in ELO Sale or enjoy a summer with family and friends. ISY does not allow choice and the ability to reinforce what students don't understand. This is year five of adding about 30 additional days to the innovative school calendar. I'm asking to please reconsider ELO sale at Roscoe Nix with the traditional school calendar. Please end the additional mandatory 30 days. This program was supposed to expand to additional schools, yet this initiative was removed from FY24 budget, which makes me ask about the future of the program. Looking at the ISC outcome report of 2021 completed by MCPS, Office of Shared Accountability, on page six it states, mean math scores of grade two students in both ISC and non-ISC schools decreased further in fall 2021. On page 10 it states, there's no evidence of an impact of reading in grades two and three. Roscoe Nix is a primary school, pre-K to second grade. The report did not provide any data that the additional 30 days had a positive impact on reading grades pre-K through two. Please reconsider ELO sale at Roscoe Nix with a traditional calendar. My family at Nix means a lot to me. Thank you. Thank you. Saeem Beg. All right. Um, good. Uh, good afternoon again, board. So my, I'm here for the opt out again. And uh, my concerns are basically that uh, what questions are the kids going to ask when these stories come up? Uh, what are the boundaries set by the teacher? How do we know that it's not going to break into um, sex ed? Because I mean, this is the norm now, right? Unless the Supreme Court steps in and changes something, this is what this is what we have. So let's try to deal with it in a way that's respectful to the Muslim parents as well. I mean, I know we're taking into consideration what other parents are saying, but we really haven't had a chance to step in and give our ideas or and the. 
the thing is, if, if no one was able to give their ideas, that would be fine. We'd be like, okay, well, you know, the board, this is how the board operates. Uh, they do it. They, they're educated, and, and they, we trust them. We voted them in to make the right decision. But that's not the case. A lot of people are coming in through those doors. And uh, the Muslim representation is not good at all. Um, it never has been. So we just want some representation, too. If they're going to be there and they're going to say, you know, these are the things they want and this is the norm, we, we're going to have these books and we're going to read them to the kids, even though I just think society is becoming so hypersexualized. And it's not just today. It's been like that since I was a kid. I mean, people were spinning the bottles and all this type of stuff when I was young, too. And those are th we're trying to protect the innocence of the youth, regardless of what um, community, if we want to call it community, regardless of what people's minds are like, you know, individually, individuals. So we just want to protect the innocence as Muslims of the youth. And we're seeing a lot of people come in and, and they're being able to share their ideas and their beliefs, but we are not. And um, so we want the opportunity to come in and talk to you all as well and give you our ideas and even sit with those parents and say, look, because I think as parents, like I'm not a cloud chaser. I'm a parent. Uh, there's a lot of people that came through and they're just like, hey, you know, we're doing this for the cause. I'm doing it for my kids. And I think people that are here doing it for their kids, they should they should even sit together and um, and, and you all could facilitate something like that. Uh, I think it would be helpful for us if we're going to move forward with this. And, you know, we're not taking our kids out of the school system. Obviously, it's a good school system. Let's do it together. Then. Thank you. Up next, we have uh, Kirubel Frezebet and Tirsit Wildemariam. And uh, Kirubel Frezebet, you may begin. Thank you. Thank you for giving me a chance to speak again. I thank my fellow Ethiopian community member for validating our fear that the LGBT curriculum will be used to outcast our children if we don't accept certain ideologies. May I ask whatever happened to tolerance, diversity, inclusion? What's next? Reorient reorientation camps for us? It's amazing to see how the LGBTQ movement goes from asking equal rights to don't give rights to opt out In, within a few years. I think we all know that foreign laws have no merits in an argument against people who are just asking for their American constitutional rights. I'm deeply troubled why only two African countries that are predominantly black are mentioned as if we, those kind of laws are only present in black African nations by my fellow Ethiopia. But since action of foreign countries are brought to our argument here, let me make my own reference to other nations. Children in countries that are vying for dominance in the world are being taught math and science in an epic scale. But somewhere here in America, we are having a school system that seems to think finding ways to teach children how to use their genitals in an unconventional way is more important than finding ways to advance math and science skills in America, which America is falling behind alarmingly. Or does this school system believe that children from underserved, as underserved communities that can't afford to go to private schools don't need maths and science. May I remind my, com my, my lawyer community member that the Constitution prohibits the government from using public funds to affirm beliefs on ways people can use their genitals or what they think of themselves. It's clearly stated that in the establishment clause of the First Amendment. I have one message from Abraham Lincoln from ev for, for everyone who's supporting this. Those who deny freedom to others deserve it, not for themselves, and under just God, cannot long retain it. Thank you. Thank you. Sid, you may begin. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I am here today as a resident of Montgomery County and on behalf of my religion group. <coughs> so my main idea is that we, the straight people, uh, to get our uh, respect and the right to, to teach our religion according to how our, uh, our religion taught us. So that way they can have their positive impact, not only in the school and wherever they go. So that's what I want to say. Thank you, ma'am. Our next three speakers are on video. If we could get Angela Wu, please play the video. Good morning. My name is Angela and I'm currently 11th grade at MCPS. 
I'm here as an ally to the LGBTQ plus community to support efforts in creating a school environment that is safe and inclusive for all our students to grow up and thrive in. As a student from an immigrant household, I was never really taught about the LGBTQ plus community at home and was never really exposed to an environment with openly LGBTQ plus peers before high school. This left me uneducated, even ignorant about the experiences and issues my fellow classmates have faced and has made it hard for me to understand and connect with them. The scenario that I and many more students with similar backgrounds have gone through has contributed to and will continue to contribute to an intolerant and non-inclusive school environment. However, with the curriculum that adequately addresses our lack of knowledge and accurately reflects the real diversity of our county, we can allow students to respect and value the identities of their peers and create an environment that fights against any discrimination, prejudice, and ignorance that might make their way into our communities. Furthermore, I think I can speak on behalf of everyone here when I say that the safety of our students is of our utmost priority. So why should we exclude our LGBTQ plus students and make them feel as if schools are their battleground when it comes to their rights and identities? Clear statistics from GLSEN have shown that students at schools with an LGBTQ plus inclusive education have reported lower levels of victimization and harassment, missed fewer days of school and even have a higher GPA in comparison to students at schools that did not cover LGBTQ plus topics in education. If we want students to truly feel safe in schools, we must continue to have a curriculum that facilitates the support and acceptance of our LGBTQ plus peers. Overall, LGBTQ plus students with inclusive curricula in their schools are doing better mentally, physically, and even academically. Similarly, inclusive books help others who don't identify as LGBTQ plus to recognize and be aware of the diversity that exists in their communities and the real world. If anything, we should be pushing for a more LGBTQ plus inclusive curriculum, whether that be in our health classes, into harassment modules and training, books, or even just in general. Thank you. If we could have the next video from Jax Kobe. Hello, Dr. McKnight and members of the MCPS Board of Education. My name is Jax Kobe. I use they them pronouns, and I am a senior at Wooten High School. I don't usually agree with people from extremist groups, but Moms for Liberties, Montgomery County Chair, Lindsay Smith, and I do in fact have some common ground. Corroborating with what she said to you on April 20th, I would like to point out the inaccessibility of holding public comment sessions during the school day. To students like me, to MCPS staff, and to many parents, this time doesn't work. I'm here to testify that I'm in school right now, which should be obvious to you, but given that the public testimony slots are scheduled for now, maybe it's not so clear. Assuming your meeting is on time right now, I'm in my statistics and mathematical modeling class. Even if you're running late, I'll be in my AP Human Geography class. Either way, I appreciate the ability to testify through video, but I'm in school and it's not the same as testifying in person. In the past, when I've gone to board meetings, I've brought signs based on some wrong info I think might come up in misinformed testimonies. But I can't be at the meeting with you today, so you won't see my signs during other parts of the meeting, but let me still try to get my messages across to clear some things up. One. Uncle Bobby's wedding and Tango Makes Three aren't sexual. Beetleman was sexual, but inclusive books are not sexual. And plus, nobody needs to worry because MCPS barely even teaches sex during health classes. Next, I would like to point out identity does not equal ideology. So if you heard that, that's just not true either. Moving past books and bigotry, let me remind you that the implementation of gender inclusive restrooms doesn't just mean renovations. Signs are $10 each with no bulk discount. And so for each school to have three gender inclusive restrooms is only $60,000. Let me be concise. As a student in MCPS, I'm here to tell you this. Meeting time bad, opt out bad, inclusive books good, inclusive restrooms good. Thank you. We could bring our last video, Abraham Sadat. Good morning, Board of Education members. I'm Abraham Sadat pronouns he, him. I'm testifying as a member of the Coalition for Inclusive Schools and Communities. I'm here to talk about the agenda item regarding National Suicide Prevention Week. I'm the teacher advisor for the Muslim Student Union of the high school I teach at in Anne Arundel County, and I myself am a Muslim American. Muslim voices are marginalized and erased from conversations, and recent debates around religion and inclusive curriculums has made it even more lucid that Muslim queer voices are even more marginalized and erased. I remember talking to a trans Muslim friend of mine who said it feels like the only safe space they have from bigotry towards their religion, culture, and sexuality is a tiny corner of Twitter where the handful of other openly queer Muslims exist. The Muslims for Progressive Values talked to queer Muslims who said that they, quote, stopped going to Masjid for Juma because apparently they don't want me. And, quote, I feel like I have to hide my queerness in Muslim spaces, so I just practice by myself. Unfortunately, I know multiple queer Muslims who ended their lives, 
including an MCPS student. In May of 2013, when I was a junior in high school, Yusuf Awad, then a 10th grade student at Walt Whitman High School, chose to end their life. People, my friends discovered Yusuf's videos on YouTube just weeks after their death, where Yusuf talked about cutting, coming out as trans, and rejection from their community and culture. This was a suicide that could have been easily prevented, and it wasn't. In light of recent debates about storybooks, I urge you to keep the stories of Muslim queer students close to you as you talk about suicide prevention. Thank you. Um, that concludes our public comments. The next business meeting of the Board of Education for public comment is September 21st, 2023. Sign-ups for public comment will open on Thursday, September 14th, 2023 at 6 p.m. In addition to online sign-ups for public comment, we allow for in-person same-day sign-ups when space allows. Unallocated slots may be filled on a first-come, first-served basis on the day of the meeting. In order to sign up in person, please arrive 15 to 20 minutes before the start of the open session and sign the form. In-person sign-ups will close 15 minutes before public comment begins or when all slots are filled. I will now turn to my colleagues to see if there are any questions or comments. I just want to uh, reiterate one of the points by one of the students, which was that I think the, the board meetings in the time of public comment definitely you know, we, we, we should look into maybe moving that to a time where more students can um, testify because that is something I've heard, like, I think if I'm running a tally, like 20 to 30 times already, which is like, I'm dying to give public comment, but it cuts in school almost all the time. Um, so if there's any way, you know, this is just, you know, kind of spitballing here, but if there's any way to, to do that, that would definitely be something I'd recommend looking into from a student perspective. That's it. Thank you. Ms. Wolf. Yes, I'd like to respond to our Muslim parent that felt that his student would become outcast because they don't have the same belief that we have about our curriculum. I want them to know that that is just not true. Every student in this system is important to us. We may disagree about some things, but we do not disagree about what our job is, and that is educating every student that comes through our door. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Yang? Ms. Yang? Um, um, hello, um, everyone. I have, um, I uh, associate myself with the comment of Mrs. Wolf, and I also want to see if staff member can follow up with Mrs. Jones, uh, the counselor, about the uh, therapy uh, sessions at her elementary school to see whether these students uh, can continue with their therapist. Thank you so much. Okay, Ms. Uh, Harris. Uh, yeah, um, just a follow up. This is the second um, <clears throat> meeting in a row where we've heard comment from the Knicks community about the impacts of the ESY, the extended school year. And um, I guess two questions. I know it's been a difficult to assess the impacts of that program because of its time of implementation and confluence with the pandemic. And I know uh, at our last meeting, um, Dr. Addison gave us our, the, the schedule of program evaluations for this year, and I'm not remembering if ESIY was on there. So I do, ESY, I believe, was one that was an on, noted for ongoing evaluation. Um, thank you for bringing up that very point, though, because I did want to just say we have stated in our study that one of the limitations of really looking at uh, data and the impact of it was that that model was implemented right during COVID-19. And so when we studied the model, we listed that as a limitation. I want to take us, and I think this is maybe a conversation we want to come back to. One of the reasons around why that model was built was to be able to support a community need for their students to be in school for a longer period of time. And we also looked at data over time in some of our communities in which we saw um, over time not being able to make some of the academic impact that we need to make. I think we want to come back and revisit why some of that came up. Um, look at also in comparison to that what the summer school enrollment had been in those areas to be able to look at 
was there actual participation in the summer programs? And what does the attendance look like to, to really look at the engagement that's happening in those schools right now? So I, I definitely appreciate the perspective and comments that were coming forward, but I, I do believe we need to go back and look at why that model was developed and look at some comparative data around current engagement, which means attendance, and prior to that, what the engagement had been in the summer school program. And then still talk with our community to talk about how all of this is playing out. I heard, and, and we've heard this uh, pretty frequently, one of the challenges with that model have been with our families when they have children who are in the extended year schools and they have kids who are in the comprehensive mm -hmm. school. So I hear that loud and clear, and that may be something we want to go back and do some further engagement around. Um, I don't want to throw any particular ideas out there, but maybe we need to investigate you know, choices and options right. mm -hmm. within Siblings. that model um, so that families can make a determination about if that's something that they can balance or not. So, And I know um, one of the commenters mentioned that initially in the first round of our operating budget conversations this year, there was a recommendation from the system to plan for expansion of both our two-way immersion and our um, ES, our innovative calendar schools. And the board asked that we slow that down and make sure we were doing it really thoughtfully. So there was, um, even before the budget challenges that we had, um, the intent to create a position that was really just going to focus on the evaluative piece and the engagement piece around our two-way immersion and extended uh, or innovative calendar schools. And I'm just not remembering if with the, the way the budget came down, if that position was salvaged or if that was one of the things that we were not able to fund. The position, I don't believe, we did not keep the position. What we did make a commitment to do was to, with internally within our offices, develop teams to study those models and go out and do some more research and engagement with the community to get a better sense of if we do need to make changes within the model, what those changes should be. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mrs. Andreski? Yes, thank you. Um, and I, I want to say I appreciate you looking at the, the summer program as well, the summer sales uh, program as well. Um, couple of things. I first I want to start with um, thanking all of our principals and building service workers and support staff and teachers and everybody who participated in supporting all of our tours around um, last week and this week and whatever. Um, I know it's always like one more thing for them, but um, I very much appreciated and enjoyed the schools that I was able to get to. Um, in terms of the public comments, um, Ms. Jones um, mentioned, spoke about the mental health support contracts, and this is concerning to me because, um, you know, we went through a lot of discussion over, I want to say multiple years, but certainly many, many months on the contracts to get mental health support since we weren't able to staff them all you know, enough ourselves. Um, so I'm curious as to what's happening with those contracts, why we would not renew, and why we would switch to something different. I can see adding another vendor or supports group, but if our students already have relationships with these people who have been working with them, um, what the reasoning is behind switching that. So I'll invite, I think, Mr. Monteleone I saw in the audience. Yep. Can you come down to the table? There's a question about the contracts of the mental health supports. Um, some of it stemming from Dr. Jones's. Absolutely. Thank you. So also Dr. Uh, Chester is here as well. So uh, we have, we put forth RFPs over the last couple of years for Jessa, right? Uh, and and thrive and we brought them forward to the board and they were they were approved and so we have expanded our resources to about 58 additional schools over the last two years to provide those supports to students where we found that there's a mental health or a wellness desert so to speak um, one of our contractors uh, was providing services without an RFP um, and without a contract to some of our schools um, and this came to our attention and we worked with OGC to ensure that they were not providing those services outside of a contract. This was something that our office or prior to my leadership, 
that we had inherited, and we spent a lot of time last year to clean up the RFPs, to clean up the MOUs, and to ensure that we were tight and coherent and alignment with where we should be. So this is, this is recent. I will say that we have a transition plan in place for schools that had been receiving services without that contract in place, that in this particular school, it is JESA. Right? But we have been in clear, clear communication and collaboration with OGC uh, on this issue um, and have been able to communicate to this provider. They cannot provide these services outside of having a contract to our students. So this is really what that is about. Um, I can provide f uh, further details uh, in a follow-up. Dr. Chester could come and speak to the situation. <coughs> but what I want to assure the board is that we do have services in place. <coughs> there is a contractor that we have providing services to this school and others, um, and that we are transitioning into that plan. And there's a plan in place for each school. And the principals have been communicated with, um, both from our office and in concert with OGC. So is the, um, the company, the company that was currently there, are they able to apply for a contract with MCBS? They certainly could have last year for this this one. Okay, but not going forward. I just, sure. you know, we've, through policy committee and everything else, worked very extensively on this with both um, telehealth services as well as in, in school support. So I just want to make sure we're not taking steps backwards. Thank you. <clears throat> just to reiterate uh, what Mr. Montiglione uh, just explained, and thank you so much for coming to the table, is we want to make sure... No, you can say It's fine. <laughs> so that's a follow-up. Um, the goal is that we are able to provide the schools who need the mental health support with the support. It's just that we want to do it in, uh, in a compliant way in, in line with being able to have a contract. As you know, when we develop contracts around mental health services, and so we've learned over the last couple of years, we have to be very careful to make sure that contract is in place because it involves um, a lot of uh, confidentiality um, that requires a, a lot of agreement, you know, agreement from the students and others. And so we have to be very careful about implementation of that contract. This became a new world for us when we started to provide mental health services and mental health support through virtual and through contractual services. So we do want to make sure that we get that right. So thank you. Certainly. And just to add, Dr. McKnight, for, for, the, for the providers that do have contracts with these schools, right, there's a conflict there. And so we hear from some of them. We, we've got contracts with the schools, and there's another provider. I just want to be to rest assured that students do have services available, and we do have a contract in place with a provider at that school and the others. Ms. Rivetta, of it. Oh. Uh, just to follow up, I think her point is less about students not receiving service. Um, her point is. Uh, concerning about the transition, because mm -hmm. these students have established relationship mm -hmm. uh, with their prior provider. So I think this need to be uh, an engagement at the school level with the service provider, with the counselor, to see how we can best support these students and families through the uh, uh, this transition. Absolutely, Ms. Yang. And we'll okay. follow up um, to make sure that that, in fact, is happening uh, student by student. Ms. Rivetta Oven? I, I just wanted to, uh, um, Ms. Yang kind of took the words out of my mouth in a sense that I think her point was the continuum of care with that provider. And when we're dealing with mental health issues, um, building a trust with a community and kids developing a trust with a provider of mental health, it is crucial for them to be able to get uh, the care. So starting all over again with a different provider um, would probably not be as easy. So I think um, going forward, if maybe we can take some lessons from this, because somebody let this provider into that school. Somebody, this, you know, somebody made the decision that this was a good match, and somebody said this is good for our kids. So whatever we can do then to make it clear to the community our process and to folks who want to who want to provide these services and if it's an if it's a lack of knowledge on how to become a contractor i would hope that our system will be opening to helping these providers especially when it's so hard to get support for mental health these days but my question is a little bit further that something that mrs jones touched on um i know we had um i i know these services are available but from CNMI districts, some schools had these services available, 
but the providers were not in the schools because they were expected to have a place to be able to hold these interactions with students, and there was a lack of um, a place to be able to hold these sessions, and some of those, you know, some of those schools were not doing it because of that. So I guess my question is, do we have any schools in that procurement in that situation where we do have a provider, but they're not going in until they actually have a place because of confidentiality and so on, that is their place to be able to see kids. Um, and if we do, what are we doing about it? Um, and uh, with the Roscoe Nick situation, um, one of the things I heard from the parent and, and from, um, from our teacher was how is success being measured in this program and whether the goals of that program are being met for pre-K to second, because I think she said we have evidence based for third grade and up, but pre-K to second, um, and I think that's, that's, that is a very um, fair question <laughs> to have. And as, a, as somebody who was a parent to three kids in three different grades, it is very challenging that as, you know, as well to be able to deal with schedules. So anything that we can do to alleviate that for parents, I think will be, would be great. But um, just those questions. And I know this, you know, we're just coming out of pandemic and it's a lot on our plates, but just to be conversant of that. And as always, I appreciate the testimony of our students. I think it's wonderful to have their voices, even if it's through through video. Um, and just to say that this last week was absolutely a wonderful week to see so many new little people getting on those buses, barely making the first step, and we have to like help some of them with their backpacks to be able to make it through. But just to assure the parents out there that as a community and as a school system, we value each child that goes through our schools. And somebody said, we love them as they come. And that should be the goal of every school system is to love and, and do an affirmation of every child, regardless where they come from, what they look like, what they speak at home, or what religion they practice. And I think that is something that I'm a proud, um, you know, a proud graduate of Montgomery County Public Schools and a proud mama of, you know, kids who graduated from MCPS. Thank you. Thank you. So now um, we will move on to our next agenda item. That is item number six. Um, this is the presentation of the board's agenda for business meeting topics for the year. So every year uh, the board holds a, if we could get the first slide. Every year the board holds a, a retreat to evaluate our priorities for the year. Of course, we have our strategic plan pillars. The board priorities come from the strategic plan pillars. But this is our way of um, sharing with this, the superintendent and her leadership team uh, where the things that we want to get done, the things that we want to address uh, this year. And so we have completed uh, our agenda setting process for the year with the administration, and we wanted to share that with the community with our board members so that we all can see what the plan is for the year. Um, we did um, take into consideration the board priorities, so you should see those reflected here. The administration has our retreat document where we went through and added additional details to our board priorities, so they will incorporate those into the meetings. One of the things that we asked for was that there was not just two big data presentations for, per year with the evidence of learning, but rather that we were monitor progress monitoring all along the way. So you will see um, every month some data presentation which just tells us and the public, okay, we are, we're working towards our big evidence of learning presentation in October, but this is the, the latest and most recent data that we have on achievement at different levels. So today, for example, we will have Dibble's results so that we are on top. If, if, if math and literacy improvement is one of our biggest priorities, then we have to stay on top of it every single month because th that's how we're going to get the results. Um, next slide. This is just, I'm not going to go through every month, but you have it on your handout and you have it on the slide just to give you an idea of what each month looks like. We also, you will also see a lot of blueprint presentations because those are required 
that we do certain number of blueprint presentations uh, throughout the year. There's always things that come up that the board has to take action on, so you will see those in throughout the, the months. Um, as I mentioned, our board priorities are reflected here, so you will see a presentation on, uh, next slide please, uh, for example, uh, staff diversity, the recruitment and retention presentation. Um, and uh, we, we know that it's hard to, things come up throughout the years, it's hard to make a plan for the entire school year, so we will be revisiting um, the, the, uh, the plan for the year in uh, January. So um, let's see which slide are we on. This is the fourth slide here. Just, you know, this is where you see recruitment, retention, and grow your own. Financial literacy comes back to us. Next slide. Just to give you a glance for the spring, we have safety and security, the ELA, English language arts curriculum adoption, continuing progress monitoring. Let's, uh, and finally, the final slide. Um, again, this similar pattern, progress monitoring with the disproportionality and suspension um, and um, other uh, things that we have to cover, including um, capital projects. So again, I just wanted to give you a taste for um, the agendas for the year. They incorporate our board priorities. We said we wanted to have progress monitoring, so that's incorporated. Blueprint is incorporated. And um, we will revisit the plan in January to make adjustments as necessary. Dr. McKnight, did you have any? No. Before I take questions. Yes, please. Um, so thank you, President Silvestri, for that. I must say this is the first time that we have been able to do this process collaboratively, and I think that it has worked very well. We've gone through a year of hearing from our um, community, what are the things that they want to hear that are important, and we've been able to align our agenda, taking that feedback into consideration, as well as the alignment to the strategic plan. There are three pillars that we continue to say is our work, that God's our work in Montgomery County Public Schools, and that's got, you know, undergirded through the strategic work of the Board of Education, and that is academic excellence, uh, well-being and community engagement, and operational excellence. And this is our first time actually uh, sharing with our community our overall plan for the year. And so this will allow us to better align public comment to these areas so that we can hear information real time from our community around the things that we've identified as a priority. And I do look forward to us being able to implement this. So I am grateful and want to thank the Board of Education for working collaboratively with us, um, you know, over time to, to take a big undertaking of what's important and how do we want to make our main thing our main thing in our discussions throughout the entire year. So thank you so much. Ms. Yang? Uh, yes, uh, I am uh, personally excited about all the progress monitoring conversation that we are going to have. I do have a question. Uh, in our last board meeting on August 24th, we unveiled a schedule of 10 program evaluation that will happen this year. And we said that it will be a uh, public it will be reported, a conversation between poor superintendent and reported to the public. Um, so would that happen in our board meetings? Would that be added as we adjust, uh, as we evaluate this uh, schedule in January? Yes, thank you. Um, so any of the program evaluations that are related to any of the specific programs that we have in here, we will bring that in as a part of our program evaluation. Um, everything else that's not included within our agenda, we post it on the website for the public, for everyone to see what the outcome of those uh, program evaluations are. And we do that for the ones we discuss as well. Ms. Wolf? Um, th thank you for this. It definitely covers the topics that we said were important to the board. But I do have a concern about safety and security not coming up until April because the majority of the school year is over by April. And in my visits around the county, the most important topic I've heard about, right behind math and literacy, is safety. And so it seems to me that that is a topic that we would want to move up closer to the beginning of the school year. I do know that I had asked that we hold meetings around the county to get input from the community about 
the uh, implementation and effectiveness of the C mm -hmm. CEO program and whether or not uh, consideration should be given to bringing back SROs. But I don't think that we can wait until <coughs> April to make that kind of evaluation. Thank you. Ms. Evans? Yes, I'll just comment off of Ms. Um, Wolf and something that Ms. Silvestri said earlier. So the beauty of sharing with everyone our agenda topics for the whole year is that you will be able to see how there, there are times throughout the year when something comes up that's really important that we make a switch and adjustment, right? So I just wanted, so that was perfect that you said that, Ms. Wolf, so that our community can hear and know that what we oftentimes have done in the past is shifted our agenda to bring up a topic that was going to come up in the spring and have it come up in the fall. But we did want to be transparent and show that, you know, we are doing our due diligence and showing you what the work looks like and that is laid out for the entire year. But in the event that we have to make a change, that we will do that. So you are right. There are things that are happening and coming up that will more than likely prompt us to make that change. But um, I just thought it was a great opportunity to share with the community that this is something that we did discuss by putting out a plan a whole year in advance could mean that we would make a change and make an adjustment. And so you may see that, right? And so um, Ms. Wolf, that was perfect. And so I just wanted to piggyback off of you and let our community know that that, that is our intention at all times. And also I think it's important for our community to see that we do. Um, we're deliberate and intentional in our planning and working alongside the superintendent, but um, the board has priorities that we want to make sure that are infused in our agenda and that our community hear topics that, um, that are important and that we all value. And so that was the whole intent behind sharing our agenda for a whole year. So just, just know it could change, but we'll make sure that we don't violate anything and we let you know in advance if it's going to change. Well, I appreciate that, but I would really like us to reconsider the timing of this because, you know, especially in light of what happened after the football game the other day, people are very concerned about the safety. And although I recognize this was not an event inside of our buildings, I think it's something that we can't afford to ignore. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Dr. McKnight, Dr. Mr. Hall. Yes, so thank you, Ms. Wolf. I mean, and again, I think we can actually do that. Yep. Um, we can actually do that, and I think the example that you brought up was very good. In addition to that, I know the community member, uh, the cluster meetings that the board members had last year, safety was one of the number one topics that came up through our um, families. And so I do think you raise a great point, and I think that's an adjustment that we are happy to make. As we are on that topic, you are absolutely right, Ms. Wolf. You um, requested that we go out back out into the community to do some engagement to get some understanding. We all acknowledge that the environment has been different since COVID-19. As we look at safety and security measures, we've put a number of things in place, but it's almost like, you know, we have to do a study of a, uh, of a new landscape. Um, and so we appreciate that. Mr. Hull, I'm sure, turned his light on because um, he wants to just give a quick update in terms of where we are with that, just so that you'll see how we're doing that, because I think that community engagement piece will be perfect to come back this fall. And then we can make that as an agenda topic when we have that engagement work completed. Mr. Hall? Yep, thank you. Um, so we are happy to come back and talk about security anytime, uh, certainly. I do believe as part of the agenda setting, we said that we would provide the board a memo in November, kind of highlighting um, where we're at with security and anything that has come up um, since the beginning of the school year. So we'll certainly do that. And again, we're willing to come back and talk about it uh, anytime. As far as the engagement piece that you had mentioned at the previous board meeting, that is uh, work that is underway right now. And so we are um, engaging in that as, as we as we speak. Mr. Verabin. Um Thank you. I um, I also want to um, join in with my colleague um, on saying that that whole security piece, and it's not just the security security, but it's also for me. In the last couple of weeks, has become clear that it's also the security of our children are our bus stops. And, um, and just the safety of our kids on state roads, how many you know bus stops we have on state roads, why we have them on state roads, and um, just I want to, that to me is also a piece of this, and it needs to be discussed sooner than April. Um, I just had a question. I know with um, 
the 10 programs that we're evaluating, I thought one of them was summer school. Um, and that is definitely something I think we, we need to, to have on this agenda sooner than later. It's in January. So, it's in January. Okay. Awesome. Okay. I didn't see it. Thank you. Um, just to, to, to highlight that, but, um, on the security issue, I, I think it's better to be, um, uh, more proactive than reactive, but thank you uh, for reminding us that that's, you're going to give us a preview on in November. I just one more thing. Um, so and the whole point was not to say Ms. Wolf was wrong. I do agree. And we should, and maybe what could be done is the framing of what the engagement meetings are going to look like. So sooner rather than later does make a lot of sense. But it would be a good opportunity to just kind of frame what the upcoming meetings would look like for our, um, a portion, whatever was going to be shared. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity um, to share the, the plan for the year. And now we will move on to agenda item number seven, a continuation of the opening of schools presentation. And uh, so we started this presentation at the last board meeting, and so we look forward to continued uh, updates about how it's going as, as we enter our second weeks, including things like safety and security. So, Dr. McKnight? Okay. Thank you, uh, Ms. Silvestri. So um, as the staff are coming to the table, we are going to have a part two continuation of the opening of schools for 23-24 uh, school year. So last week, um, we all shared our excitement about seeing buses on the road for orientation. Buses were back on the road um, for the start of the school year. And I do, do just want to again acknowledge it has been great to have our children picked up this year and not uh, suffer through some of the transportation issues that we have in the past. Um, we know that it's all about the tenor of how we open up the year and getting students to school is a very, very important part of that. So I, again, just want to thank our operations, Mr. Hull, that transportation team, and everyone for the commitment that they have brought to the work this year to make sure that we are getting our students transported to school. I know it sounds minor, but I want to remind us to celebrate the things that may seem minor now, but last year, there was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears around that situation. So, you know, we, we, we don't want to forget that and recognize that there are so many people, hundreds of them, who were committed to making sure that was not our story this year. And so I'm just very, very grateful. So it was a busy week last week. We welcome back over 160,000 students and staff and, and, and families back in, well, over 160,000 students, uh, over 25,000 staff members. Um, and of course, they all represent our families in Montgomery County Public Schools. We had our last board meeting on August 24th, and that's when we shared what our planning was to open up the doors of the school year. I'm proud to say that the conversation we have today is one that we're going to share because we were all together last week, doing, uh, going out on school visits together. Uh, Mr. Vera Oven and I had a open up with a day party at Clarksburg High School for their for, yeah, 4:30 a.m. in the morning, and it was just amazing. Um, and so, thank you to all board members for going out to the schools with us. Ms. Madraska, you mentioned this, and you say it's an extra thing, but actually, our staff feel so much pride in us showing up for them. Um, and being there to be their cheerleaders as they come back and welcome our students into the school year. So I want to thank you for that um, because it means a lot to the staff. It means a lot to us, and, and it was just really a great week. So today we're going to spend some time talking about not just what the plans were for opening. You heard that, but what happened after we opened the doors, um, what some of those things were that we learned as we opened the doors. We've had um, some of our principals open up some very innovative ideas. Dr. Barber, welcome to the table. I think I also saw Mr. Brown here from Einstein. Um, so we have some of our principals here because they are leading the work on the ground. And so we welcome them to the table this week to actually talk about the experience. Um, I will continue to bring it back to our board priorities as well. You know, we talked a lot about community engagement. Dr. Barber, every time I look at you, I think about the, the, the close to perfect example. I always say that because we say there's no perfection, always room for growth, but the close to perfect example of community engagement and living that out um, for a community that shows 
that, oh, this is who we are collectively, meaning there is, it's hard to see a separation between the school and the people who live in that community because the two are so very connected. So thank you for making that priority come, a, come alive in every single thing that you do within that school. And the goal is that, you know, we have these examples of that type of work. We learn, we get better, and we collaborate. Um, just to celebrate that type of success. So thank you so much. So today we're going to really, again, just hear about what some of the innovative ways are that our principals have begun to engage with our parents, our community, and um, just, just overall what we've learned. And then at the same time, things that we're working on that we learned from the first week. So with that, thank you so much to the team. Welcome you to the table, um, Ms. Key, Dr. Barber, Ms. Morris, and I will turn the presentation over to you at this point to begin. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. Good afternoon, board members. We are so excited to join you this afternoon to share the highlights from opening week. Um, I had a challenge in prepping for this board meeting, and the challenge was there were so many great things we wanted to share, but we knew we couldn't be here all day. And so we wanted to highlight um, the most exciting part of the week and also identify the next level and, and work that continues. Um, as Dr. McKnight shared, the stars of our presentation, as they always are, will be our principals. We have one from each level that we are excited um, to bring to the table so that they can highlight what has happened from their perspective as they've opened their doors and welcome students and staff. Next slide, please. So again, today we're gonna to try to focus and narrow the conversation on the first week visits of schools, um, teaching, learning, and leading. You heard a lot during our last meeting about the preparation. So what did it look like when we were actually there visiting? And parent and guardian engagement. So that's what uh, the next few minutes will be focused on. Next slide, please. Um, I am so excited to share that executive and central office leaders and Board of Education members visited 187 schools last week. No small feat. Um, it included our newest school, Cabin Branch, and our newly constructed schools, Burnt Mills, Southlake, and Stonegate Elementary Schools. The way that we prioritized our school visits were for any school that had a new principal, an acting principal, or new construction. Um, although we visited 187 schools week one, we are committed to getting to all the schools, which won't take that long during the first week of September, given the high number we were able to see during opening week. And we thank you for partnering um, in that work with us. It was truly enjoyable visiting schools together. Um, during the visit, we collected data utilizing a real-time resolution form, and the data was to capture highlights and issues that needed to be addressed, either regarding facilities, materials, whatever that was. Every afternoon we met um, where we went through the documents to first celebrate um, the highlights and celebrations, but also to problem solve collectively with how we could get to re resolution for those items that we saw needed attention. Um, it was a great way to come together cross office and really brainstorm about how we could be more efficient, how we could get that resolution working quickly, and more importantly, created a structure for accountability so that we could monitor, get back, and share out the process uh, and progress throughout the week. Um, we also um, ensured that our teachers and support professionals and administrators were all ready um, as they engaged in professional learning to be ready um, for learning, leading, and teaching on day one. Next slide, please. So to that end, system-wide professional learning prepared our staff for teaching and learning, and this was inclusive for our administrators, teachers, and support staff. Our staff showed up ready, and here's why. The Department of District-Wide Professional Learning led professional learning series for all facilitators of summer learning. It included both live and on-demand learning sessions to support the design of the summer experiences that culminate in adult learning that will transform practices and change outcomes for our students. 
A key aspect of the learning was the introduction of the MCPS professional learning standards that were established last year. The standards describe the content, process, and conditions that lead to high quality leading, teaching, and supporting learning in schools. These standards will now be used to guide and support the design and delivery of professional learning across the district and will collect ongoing data on the fidelity of the standards and the impact they have on professional learning. I'm also excited to share with you that the Office of Curriculum and Instructional Programs and Special Education provided numerous professional learning opportunities focused on content, coaching, culturally relevant instructional strategies, and scaffolding to meet the needs of all learners. When exec leadership teams visited schools last week, we could see that our school staff showed up ready for instruction, as evidenced by what we saw when we visited classrooms. At the elementary level, we observed teachers incorporating tier two vocabulary instruction based on summer professional learning to meet the needs of all students, particularly our emergent multilingual learners. We also saw, saw math coaches working with grade level and course alike teams to study the curriculum and plan for effective instruction. We were thrilled to see classes where teachers were providing visuals and first language support to our emergent multilingual learners to encourage engage engagement and success in class. Here's one example of what that looks like in practice at Northwood. Students have championed the Global Gladiators Program, which is a homegrown student-led program that takes a strategic approach to welcoming and ushering newcomers into school and into the U.S. educational system. With the support of administration, these global gladiators are using their experiences as former newcomers to support current newcomers and families in order to have a culturally responsive, welcoming, and sustainable transition to Northwood. The goal is to ensure these students meet the academic and social emotional success in a supportive and nurturing environment. A big shout out goes to Ms. Murchia, who serves as the program manager. We recognize there is still variance from school to school with regard to the level of rigor we are seeing in classroom, which is why we continue professional learning throughout the year. I'm so excited that Dr. Harold Barber, principal of jo Joanne Lellick Elementary School at Broad Acres, is here at the table to share his experience around teaching and learning. Okay, thank you, Ms. Morris. Um, good afternoon, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. Thank you for this opportunity to um, share with you around teaching, leading, and learning um, regarding my school. Before I get started, I just want to kind of provide you with some background information in terms of um, our school demographic and um, composition. Um, Joanne Lellick Elementary School of Broad Acres, um, of our total school population, 87.6% of our students are Hispanic, and 9.2% of our population um, are black or African American. And the remaining 2-3% um, are either other race or uh, multiple races. And of the, um, the student groups, we have 71% of our students qualify for ELD services, and 94.9% um, of our students qualify for free and reduced meals, and 5.7% of our student population qualify for special education services. So the professional learning that we engaged in this summer with my team was um, sponsored by the Department of English Learner and Multilingual Education um, Department, and it focused on um, effective strategies and practices to help support um, student learning. Um, before I talk about um, the actual presentation itself, just want to talk about where we started as a team. We examined the data that's used to actually uh, monitor, and ac um, monitor the progress that students are making um, in English proficiency throughout years, the years. We looked at our data from 2018, 2019, and 2022. Um, the access for English language learners is the actual assessment that's used by the state of Maryland to measure English language proficiency. The state actually identifies specific targets for each school in terms of where schools should be at this particular point. So in 2018, the target that was identified for our school was 49.1%, 49 and this was pre-pandemic, and at Lellick, our percentage at that particular, during that particular year was 67%. In 2019, as we were going into the pandemic, um, the target that was identified was 51.1%, and in 
and our target, our goal for that year or that target that we hit for that year was 75.6%. And the pandemic did create some challenges for a lot of our students, but nevertheless, we still continue to persevere. And the target for 2022 was 53.2%. But our students actually um, attained 67.5%. And to put this in context, 67.5% is the goal that the state has for our school in 2029. So the goal that the school, the state has for 2029, we're hitting those targets now in 2022. And I think. Um, in reference to the professional learning that we engaged in over the summer, that's really going to put us in a position to continue to leverage the knowledge that we gained as a school team to continue to build on those, um, um, those um, data points that I just mentioned. Um, when we unpacked the data, we actually looked at um, things that we're doing well, um, such as um, listening was an area that we were doing well in, and also reading because of some of the things that we had put in place um, for our early childhood learners. But then we also examined opportunities for growth in that area as well. So we found that op an opportunity for growth was um, speaking as well as writing. So when we looked at that for our school, we were curious to see how we were doing as a district, and that kind of mirrored what we were doing as a district as well. So. Um, we know that that's the right focus for us to really continue to um, monitor and um, deepen our knowledge and understanding around. So at Lelic, I talked about our total um, EML population being 71%. As a result of having such a high EML population, we have 14.1 allocation for EML teachers. So that's a pretty large allocation. But we're very strategic in terms of how we use our EML teachers to support instruction across the board. We have a very robust co-teaching model that we use to make sure that we're tailoring our instruction around the unique needs of all of our learners. And we're seeing great um, strides in the progress that we're making. So a plan is only as good as how we actually monitor the plan. We have very tight structures in place to make sure that myself, as well as members of my core team and admin team, are in the classrooms on a regular basis, providing coaching, support, and feedback to teachers. In terms of coaching and support, that's live coaching. So we have our core team members who are co-teaching with um, classroom teachers, and also we are fortunate enough to have access to three, um, 360 cameras, so we're able to actually capture the learning that's taking place and actually use that for job-embedded professional learning based on what we're seeing on a consistent basis. So that's the plan moving forward based on the professional learning that we um, engage in over the summer, and I'm very excited about the work that we um, are going to do as a school team. I'm proud of the work that my team and I have done thus far in terms of our most recent data being at 60 67.5%, which is the goal in 2029. But our plan is to really try to get to as close as um, close to 100% as possible. So thank you for your time this afternoon. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. April Key. Thank you. Dr. McKnight, Ms. Silvestri, oh. members of the board. I'm here to talk to you a little bit about our professional development and things that happened as we prepared our educators to start the year. This year, NEO, New Educator Orientation 2023, focused on building the foundation for an anti-racist education. It was a huge success. New hires had access to the MCPS website, the NEO Google Suite, and PDO to learn more and to sign up for NEO 2023. New teachers were given an opportunity to learn more about the benefits of ERSC, Educational Systems Federal Credit Union, and teachers had the opportunity to hear from MCEA. In addition, teachers were participated in creating the Conditions for Success, which is designed to increase the capacity of teachers' ability to build learning environments that are rigorous and inclusive. Finally, teachers spent over seven hours building their skills and knowledge around specific curriculum areas. Our elementary site was Gaithersburg High School, and our secondary and specialty site was Paint Branch High School. At these sites, we had three days of NEO where teachers learn, earned a stipend pay. NEO Day 3 provides additional opportunities for learning for special education teachers. The Office of Special Education provides an additional NEO Day specifically for special education staff. The agenda includes opportunities from staff to hear the mission and vision of OSE, meet their special education area services supervisors, and receive professional learning on case management responsibilities, IEP development, preparing for the first week of school, monitoring student progress, 
and the Maryland online IEP system. All new special educators also had the opportunity to participate in the new special education new special educator PLC, which is an opportunity to receive further professional development and coaching on classroom management, time management, specifically designed instruction, IEP development, and progress monitoring. School-based and central office contacts for curriculum and instruction and other related topics all through an anti-racist, anti-biased lens. NEO 2023, Understanding and Reporting and Responding Restoratively to Incidents of Hate, Bias, Changing Bystanders to Upstanders. New, education, new Educator Orientation is available in the NEO Canvas site, so the information can be revisited. Day one, we had 973 participants. Day two, we had 890 participants. And day three, we had 258 participants. And that was asynchronous learning that they could do remotely. Now I want to talk to you a little about the consulting teachers. During the first week of school, all the consulting teachers and consulting principals were out visiting schools, providing support to our new teachers and our new principals, our actings as well. Consulting teachers partner with their teachers for the duration of the school year. 498 new teachers have been assigned to receive support from consulting teachers. The average caseload for a consulting teacher at this time is 20 new teachers. The role of the consulting teacher is to provide an ongoing and individualized support to new teachers in order to build the teacher's capacity to plan and deliver instruction, specifically through a lens of equity and anti-racist practices. Support is provided through observations with feedback, planning meetings, coaching sessions, peer visits with reflections, model lessons, data chats, coordinating school level and or district level supports for and formal documentation of progress. The role of the supporting teacher and the consulting teacher is really to make sure that we have connected with our new teachers and given them the tools that they need to be successful. Next slide. Next slide, one more. Great. Thank you. At this time, we are, get my numbers, 99.25% fully staffed. <laughs> and we've hired 1,149 teachers. I'm hopeful that um, in the next week or so, we'll be below 100 vacancies. So we're really working hard to get there. I have some information for you about security. Currently, we have six vacancies, and I want to give you just a little information about each one. Key Middle School closes tonight, and they will have candidate names sent to them tomorrow to begin scheduling interviews. Gaithersburg High School began scheduling interviews today and should have a selection early next week. Paint Branch has a brand new position that was just excuse me just allocated a couple weeks ago. They are interviewing and should should have a selection soon. Redlands Middle School's position is no longer posted. They've selected a candidate who is currently a security substitute, and so we anticipate this will be a quick transition for that position. Springbrook High School has not yet yet made a selection, although the principal does have a candidate list. Lastly is Wooten High School. They've completed their interviews and are checking references. They intend to recommend for hire today or tomorrow. That's it. Thank you. There was, lastly, is now the time to talk about the attrition data that was requested from Ms. Silvestri. Um, you can, if it's a, you can include that quick update and then we'll transition to the parent guardian engagement. Okay, certainly. Um, 
the, the report that came out last year from the Maryland State Department of Education indicated that the lowest attrition rates was 7%, and we were at 8%. The highest attrition rate was 18%. So at that time, we were doing extremely well in comparison to other, um, other counties in Maryland. This year, our raw data is showing us about 8.9%. But it has not been cleaned up, nor has it been submitted yet, and the report hasn't come out from the state. This is just teacher attrition. I have a question about security assistance. Do we have a process for, I guess, I don't know, differentiating is the word I'm looking for, where they're assigned based on level of needs or identified issues at a particular school? So I'm, I think you're asking me, are we placing people where they're needed as opposed to going well, through as, the... As opposed to just say two, 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 or four, 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 however many each high school gets. Do we look at what the profile, like last year's at that high school, looked like to decide whether or not they might need six instead of the four another high school might need? Could we get some lights turned off so we can walk in front of the Great. Uh, thank you for that question. Yes, there are a number of factors that we take into account when we're allocating the security guards. And so as we allocated the new ones, the 10 additional allocations that we had uh, in the budget for this year, some of the things that we took into consideration were uh, if a school has increased in size, um, certainly the complexity of the schools, um, the, the history of incidents, um, and there's a number of other factors. So yes, we're using um, a lot of data to determine where we need to allocate out the uh, positions. Thank you. And can I get a list of, of the schools and the number of assistants assigned to each school, high school and middle school? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, just piggyback on following, um, I will like also on the security, on the security issue, uh, do our schools like Blair Ewing uh, also get security folks assigned to them? And if when you do that list for Ms. Wolf, can you include all our schools like Rika and, and just how many how many are assigned to those to those schools as well? And I just had a quick question about the numbers you get on the training. I was just wondering. You, you gave a few num like 900 so folks, con you know, did the training, and and I just wanted to get an idea out of how many like. Was that like an 80% participation? I just want the public to know like was that. Right around 1,100. Uh-huh. So we're close to 80% participation. The concern that we have is that it's not mandatory because we don't pay. So we're working on making that a priority in the upcoming year. Yeah, so congratulations for having large participation in your new days. That's a huge endeavor. Um, my question is about consulting teachers. I know that was an accelerator uh, item that last year we were not able to fund in the end. So you mentioned that um, right now about 400 some new teachers, but that we have about close to 1,200 new hire. So. Um, I actually saw a consulting teacher in action at Westland Middle School. Fabulous, really great to see that in action. So my question is, how do you pick? It's slightly under 50% of the new hire are getting consulting teachers. So how, how do we pick and how do we make sure we have support for the other 50% that do not have the consulting teacher? So we look at teachers who are new to the profession, and certainly the ones that are brand new to the profession, just out of school or changing uh, from another profession, are the 498. The other more experienced folks may have come to us in, MC in CPS as new, will continue to get the support from um, the department, but not in the intense manner in which we provide for teachers. They're notified of PDO opportunities and content area learning opportunities, classroom management, those kinds of um, trainings that are available all the time. But the, the consulting teachers really 
get in there and support every aspect of the experience for the new teachers. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I know this is a little bit maybe uh, jumping ahead a tiny bit, but because we're having the conversation about the onboarding experiences and, um, and the trainings and things like that, um, you know, in reading through this whole presentation, uh, preparing for the meeting, um, it does show like towards the back that you did summer support um, for s summer learning opportunities for support staff. But I have heard from um, some new paras concerns over what kind of supports they have. Um, mostly this was last year, but um, going through the year because sometimes it's not the job that they think it is when they accept it. And um, I'm just curious what you're doing to su help support our uh, service um, employees, so our support staff, I'm sorry. Um, throughout the year, you know, we've got um, consulting teachers to help the teachers. We've got consulting principals um, to help our new principals, but I, I don't ever feel like I see anything about our support staff. So I'll have to get back to you on that because I can't tell you the name of the program off the top. Um, but I will certainly get that information to you. We do have um, training that is provided for support professionals, and there was a NEO for support professionals as well. But I have to tell you about the ongoing, get that information about the ongoing training that happens throughout the year. I appreciate Dr. that. Nick? Yes, I was going to say yes, and we, we can bring that back. Um, I was, through your question, was reminded, Ms. Madrowski, that this last year, that was a big piece that we included in our negotiation session with SEIU, was to focus on being able to provide more training for all of our supporting um, services staff. We actually created more time that is now um, paid time for mm -hmm. them to receive more professional development because we heard that loud and clear from them as well. So we can actually send that back to the board, what all of those opportunities are that resulted from that last year. I appreciate that. And yeah. beyond just classes if, or, you know, mm -hmm. workshops if possible, because like I said, sometimes it's the in the classroom training that yeah. they need as much as anybody else. So thank you. Mr. Saeed, and then we'll continue with Then real quick, uh, reflecting on Ms. Wolf's point from earlier on how the, the security um, you know, staff and everything like that are actually allocated um, and like what factors play in. I'm just requesting that if there is a, an actual process for that specifically, if I could receive that, because I know students have, have consistently asked me like, what is the pro, like why does maybe one school get more? What, what type does one school get and everything like that? So if there is a process for how they determine who goes where, what positions, you know, do what, um, can, I, can I get that um, after the meeting? Thank you. Sure, we'll uh, include that with the other information that was requested and send it to all the board members. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are here to talk about family engagement. Um, so if we could go to the next slide. So we wanted to just take this opportunity to talk about what's different in our schools related to family engagement. This summer, our principals had an opportunity to engage in some professional learning. And we're gonna hear from two of our principals today related to some next steps um, that came out of the learning and, and what it looked like in their schools the first week of school, or even pre-service. Mm -hmm. So family engagement, as we know, is an equity driver um, for school improvement planning. We wanted to move away from this idea that family engagement is about just informing families on here's the information to this, to this um, more empowerment, right? So we've been talking about what that looks like in our SIP and providing parents an opportunity to not just hear what are the goals of the school or here's the data, here's, the, here's what we're working on, to the idea that our parents are able to help in the decision making, informing what the school will do in terms of the actions and response to the data. So in this slide, you see the six steps of engagement um, and this tool here off on the on the right is really to help guide our principals in determining um, what are the steps that they will use to plan as they think about engagement. We have 
back to school night. We have open house. We have these large events that serve as opportunities for us to engage in our, with our families. That's not the only type of engagement that we want to focus on. We want to look at what are the one-to-one -one conversations that you're having with families and how are they giving you that feedback. So under the goals, you would see, you would see a, if a principal were in, interacting with this, um, it goes from informing parents to consulting them, to involving them, collaborating with them, and then ultimately, how do you empower them? So this tool is, help, is helpful to principals so that they are able to really think about where are they, where are they on that continuum in terms of engaging families. So with that being said, um, I just want you to think about that opportunity again. Back to school night, open house, those are big events, but one-to-one -one opportunities are just as important. So think about the concerns that you have related to attendance. That one-to-one -one conversation and where did that lands on this continuum is important uh, for our principals to really think about how are they engaging with families. Am I informing you that we have an attendance issue or am I empowering you to help me partner with you um, to support your student? So simply put, there's an expectation that our schools are engaging in two-way communication with families. We are monitoring that participation and we're asking our schools to capture feedback on whether or not the intended goal was achieved. So that's something, excuse me, that's something that's different about back to school or excuse me, family engagement. Um, so I'm going to welcome two principals here today who are going to share out pre-service um, activities that were um, done at uh, North Bethesda Middle School. And then we'll hear from Mark Brown, who is going to share a little bit about an incident that occurred his first week at school and some of the, um, how he engaged with his, his community um, to, to keep them informed. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to... Dr. Smith, who is the principal of North Bethesda Middle School, and she's going to share a little bit about her parent panel. And, and again, I want to take you back to that continuum. Was this informing or was it empowering? So as she tells her story, just think about that continuum and where we're asking for our principals to um, think about the way we're asking them to think about um, planning for those engagement opportunities this year. Thank you, Mr. Adams. Next slide. So you see here, this is just an image of the event that I'm going to share with you. Um, one more slide, please. So good afternoon, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. Thank you for having me here to have the opportunity to highlight efforts that North Bethesda Middle School is making to ensure we are empowering our parents and caregivers. The mission of North Bethesda is to provide an environment where all students thrive socially, academically, and emotionally, and we share a commitment to create a, an environment free of racism and bias. I was appointed principal of North Bethesda in 2018, and since then, every year, I've had parents or students share with me experiences of microaggressions, hate bias, racism, and that has really motivated me throughout my tenure to work very hard to make North Bethesda an inclusive environment for all. In addition to the anti-race, anti-bias audit data, which showed me, which also sort of reflected the same um, messaging that made, that called me to action to say, we've got to do more at North Bethesda. Um, we, I collaborated with Mr. Adams and Dr. Zarchin, my associate and director respectively, to create an opportunity for staff to hear directly from parents about the issues that students were experiencing, that parents were experiencing, um, maybe unintentional or intentional, and really empower the parents to be heard, but the staff to be motivated. I was confident that if they heard directly from the parents, that they would be equally motivated and inspired to take action, to continue their own personal reflection, and to really um, work on developing their practice as anti-racist um, educators. So by providing this form for, for parents, it was just um, something that I thought would bring together our community and move us forward in this work. So we put out a call for uh, 
parents and caregivers of diverse, uh, with diverse perspectives. And we were fortunate to have a great response. The panel included members of the LGBTQ community, parents and caregivers of black and brown students, special education students, including one for our new Autism Resource Resources Services Program, non-US born families, Jewish and Muslim families. And unfortunately, the two panel volunteers from our Asian community were unable to attend this time, but we um, discussed the, that they would be included in future opportunities. And on this slide, you can see uh, these were the general themes of the questions for the panel. And it was very well received by the staff. They were very focused, listening, actively listening, and engaged in follow-up conversations with the panelists after the session. The parents um, shared notes of appreciation with me afterwards, feeling that they really felt that this was an amazing opportunity for them to engage with the staff, to share their stories. They acknowledged that sometimes the topics were hard to talk about, but they were important for us to open the dialogue to make sure that we were um, aware so that we could best meet the needs of their students. And the staff were um, inspired to the Parents are our partners. They felt that they were more confident with engaging in those dialogues with parents about these hard topics. They acknowledged that in some cases they were uncomfortable hearing um, some of the experiences and perspectives of the parents, but they thought that it gave them the opportunity to reflect on their practices and continue their work towards becoming anti-racist instructors, which is you know their aspiration. Um, they felt that they heard a lot of stories that made us, um, they wanted to come together as a staff to work to support our students with feeling comfortable and making sure they had that trusted adult in the building to share their experiences of hate bias or racism so that we could support them and have them be heard. Um, and I, after the pa panel, I communicated my expectation that teachers reflect on their interactions with students often, and that may, they make changes in practice day one, you know, for the new school year. And so during our opening week, so it was after pre-service, uh, we saw some observed changes in practices and some continued um, practices that have been in place the last few years at North Bethesda. One of them was throughout the building, teachers um, planned purposeful activities for students to share their social identities and to learn about each other's social identities and build community. Um, in a music classroom, the teacher gave out a sheet with a lot of statements, and students checked the ones that they agreed, but they didn't put their name on it. And then they shared, they returned it to the teacher, who then gave it out to the whole class. So you might have gotten my paper, you might have gotten someone else's paper. And then they went through the statements and said, stand up if you have a check by that statement. And doing that, they allowed the students to see that there were other people with their experience. Some of them was, I've experienced racism. Some were, I know somebody in the LGBTQ community. You know, there were a variety of statements like that that I think you know, brought the students together. Science teachers did a lesson that was focused on diverse scientists, and then they had the students work in pairs to answer questions about um, you know, what surprised you, um, what do you have in common with this scientist, and then the students shared out and made a display for the hallway. Um, we, the teams, so at middle school we have grade level teams, they took proactive measures to um, make some phone calls to families, to ask questions, to introduce themselves, to share positives about what um, they hoped for the school year for their student. And then they also um, have a system in place to send positive postcards throughout the year. And so um, this is the beginning, but we're going to continue to work. And so some of our identified next steps, next steps are to schedule more opportunities for these kinds of forums and panels, including student <laughs> panels and forums. Um, professional learning opportunities to facilitate that staff reflection on their interactions with students and maybe unconscious biases. Partner with the PTSA to create, this came out of the panel as what we, we had been talking about doing it last year, but then to hear from a parent that they thought this would be powerful, is to have some affinity groups with our parent and caregiver community so that they could get together and share their experiences and work with us, be empowered, to um, come up with solutions to problems or to make sure that we are addressing any issues of um, 
racism and hate bias in our schools. And also through the panel, there was a desire that we pursue perhaps the designation of being a no place for hate school uh, in order to help engage our parents and caregivers and staff in dialogue and active learning on the topics of bias, bullying, inclusion, and allyship. So Mahatma Gandhi says, our ability to reach unity and diversity will be the beauty and the test of our civilization. At North Bethesda, I truly believe that these opportunities for communication and dialogue, um, such as this parent panel, are helping us move forward and unify our amazingly diverse community. And it's foundational to the creation of the school that I envision for North Bethesda, where all students feel free, a sense of inclusion, and are able to learn in an atmosphere that has no racism and is free of bias. So thank you. Back to Mr. Adams. And I'll pass it to <laughs> Mr. Brown. All right. Good afternoon, members of the board, Dr. McKnight, and guests who are present this afternoon. Um, I want to share with you uh, my recent experience using uh, the Remind app to communicate to um, my community. Um, unfortunately, I was not at um, uh, work at the beginning of the school day on the first day of school. My children um, had their first day of school. My son was going to kindergarten, so I was home, um, you know, <laughs> with my son um, as he was getting on the bus. Also, unfortunately, I had to run an errand for my wife in the morning. And <laughs> on my way to run that errand, um, I received a phone call from a uh, assistant principal at the school. It was about 7.44, so I knew something was wrong, and she shared with me that there was a smell of gas um, in the building. And I remember from my training from Jeannie Dawson over here, if there is gas, call, uh, make the call. So I made the call that we were going to evacuate the building. Um, unfortunately, um, I was not able to use Synergy to make a mass, uh, send a mass message to families, and uh, there is no uh, Connect Ed or Blackboard app that I was able to use. Uh, fortunately, we are a pilot school for Remind. Uh, we rolled out Remind last school year, and during pre-service, uh, Jenny Trombatori came out and she trained our staff uh, to use Remind, so about um, probably two-thirds of our staff are currently trained to use Remind. Um, but I also didn't download the app on my phone, but I was able to do so while I was at the stoplight. So I did go into, um, into the app store, I downloaded Remind, and by the time I got to my destination, um, the app, app was downloaded, and I spent about three minutes in a parking lot and sent a simple message to the community to say, there is a smell of gas in the building, we are evacuating to the stadium. Um, when I made it back home, after several phone calls, we were able to clear the stadium and the building and come back into the building. And so I sent another remind message to, um, to the community to share with them that the building was clear and we were coming back in. Um, unfortunately, the next day, uh, we had uh, um, a community concern and we needed to send another message on remind where we went into a shelter in place. Um, just going back to the first day for a moment, uh, when I returned to work uh, that afternoon, to not that afternoon, that morning, um, after my children got on the bus, I had several staff members share with me that the message that came through on Remind was very timely because even though everyone did what they were supposed to in getting evacuated from the building into the stadium, several students and staff began to ask, why are we evacuating? And the message came through to everyone at the same time. So students received it on their email, families received it um, via text message, and um, staff received it via text message at, all, at the same time. So everyone knew from the application uh, why we were evacuating. And again, like I said, I sent another message the next day. So I had a uh, experience the first two days, unfortunately, using Remind to report a serious incident. The reason this excites me is because we also had a serious incident last year where we went into a lockdown um, at Albert Einstein, um, and there were some um, gaffes with uh, communicating that we were in a lockdown and using Synergy. So one of our concerns is that Blackboard is able to send a message to, to everyone, um, excuse me, uh, to families and to parents, and it, we're able to send it via text, via phone or via email. We're not able to send it to students. 
using Synergy, I can email students, I can email staff, I can email families. I cannot text them, I cannot call them. And while Blackboard does translate into Spanish, um, you have to do a lot of selections in order to make sure that happens. In Synergy, if you click mass email, all of the grades, select teachers, but you forget to click two, it's not going to go to those individuals. And that's what I did last year. In Synergy, excuse me, and Remind, all I needed to do was go into the app, click everyone, click urgent, and it went to everyone at the same time. The other beauty about it is, unfortunately, in Blackboard, some parents opt out of connected messages. Um, and unfortunately, they'll tell you they didn't receive some of your messages. Um, but it is because m many families, unfortunately, opt out. And sometimes it's because it sends messages every day to say that a student hasn't been in class or that they're late. And it does get a little tiring having to receive those messages. Well, in Remind, um, you do have the option to opt out unless I send an urgent message. If I send an urgent message, you're going to receive it regardless. So I did have a couple of families say, please stop texting me. Um, <laughs> but I received about 150 to 160 messages that simply said, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, please keep me posted. Some of those messages were a, a simple thumbs up. Right, so the two-way communication worked perfectly using the Remind app. And for all of the educators in the room, uh, you know sometimes you're on your grave, uh, excuse me, on your deathbed before you receive a message that just says, thank you. So receiving 150 of them at one time, uh, it was pretty refreshing for me. And having not been in the building at the time that everything occurred. Um, so it was also a um, very simple process for me to be able to communicate. Um, and so I appreciate it using that. Um, I do want to share a few other things. I, like I said, we are a pilot school, and, um, and we've, gotten, uh, we've got training um, right from the beginning. We uh, offered uh, two um, choice sessions during pre-service, uh, where Jenny Trombatori again came out and provided training for us. Uh, I've used it to communicate serious incidents so far. Uh, we've used it to communicate back to school night. In the future, we will use it to communicate parent-teacher conferences. I use it to communicate my weekly newsletters. I do my weekly newsletters um, using the S'more um, uh, platform. And fortunately, um, Remind is able to upload from S'more, um, so I don't have to send two messages. I can just send it through Remind. Um, but I did also learn that the communication of Remind primarily goes to one um, uh, platform, either text or phone or email. So I'll probably continue to use Synergy um, to send those messages as well. Um, but it was great that I was able to just use that one platform. And I didn't need to translate it because the recipient chooses their preferred language to receive it in. So all I had to do was send one message in English and whichever language you want to receive that message in, you will receive it in that message. And when that recipient responds to that message in their preferred language, I receive it in my preferred language. Um, so that was beautiful for me. Um, last week, we have 44 teachers who sent 2,400 students' messages and to 3,100 parents. This week, we have 35 teachers who have sent messages to students and families. Um, I'm still learning how to analyze all of the data, so I can't tell you how many messages um, were received. Um, but as of today, 34 teachers sent messages. And the beauty about that also is with the 44 teachers last week, it was just the first week of school. So 100% of our students are um, signed up to use Remind. 100% of our families are signed up to use Remind. And that is a bit of cherry picking because Remind reads right off of Synergy. So as long as you're in Synergy, you are in Remind. So we are able to communicate with everyone without having to take an extra step to do that. One of the things in pulling the limited data that I'm able to pull at this time that was interesting to me is that 77% um, or 2,395 of our parents are active on Remind via text message. And so 77% 
via text message tells me that when we send these messages through Synergy or we send them through Blackboard, even though you have the option to use text message mini opt out, that Synergy, though it is great, email is not the best method for us to communicate with families. So 77% receiving messages through Remind in their preferred language without having to sign up for it um, was great for our school and a, and a huge benefit. So thank you um, to our tech team for um, bringing Remind to us. Um, we certainly look forward to continuing to use it in the future and communicate with our families. And I'll turn it back over to Mr. Adams. Thank you for that. Um, I heard some amen over here back. <laughs> so, so there's some great, some great um, things to share. So I just want to wrap that conversation about Remind Up. So it's a district-wide communication platform that provides that two-way dialogue. Um, you heard Mr. Brown talk about getting feedback from parents. Um, so that's important, just a message there. During the summer and pre-service, we worked to train staff and school leaders on this app. Uh, we created three self-paced courses in addition to holding multiple face-to-face -face workshops. We also provided training to staff during pre-service staff meetings. This prepared teachers and school leaders to use Remind as the primary communication tool beginning in pre-service and during the first week of school when these incidents occurred at Einstein. So during the first week, more than 60 schools began using the new uh, tool, and we will have more signing up for staff training over the next few weeks. All schools will be trained by um, winter break. So huge shout out to Kira Trinkamp uh, and her team and Stephanie Sharon. I know that this is um, going to help with that two-way communication. Um, with that being said, again, focus on this two-way communication. I want to give a shout out to the Watkins Mill Cluster. They're hosting, you have three schools hosting a back-to-school um, event for, their, for, for their, their communities. I also want to just take a moment, I was talking to Loretta Woods at um, Whetstone, um, and they did the feedback before back-to-school event happened. So just really thinking about how our principals are talking and getting feedback from our families um, is something that we're seeing shifting in our schools. Um, and so we, we hope to see uh, more of our families feeling like they are being heard and empowered. And we're going to open it up for discussion at this time. Next slide. Okay. Mr. Saeed, Ms. Yang, and then Ms. Rivetta Oven. First, just want to say fantastic job uh, on the use of the Remind app. I mean, seriously. Um, the thing is, you know, I know I'm young. I'm supposed to be the tech savvy one, but maybe I can get some of that training because I'm a little bit uh, <laughs> confused on a couple aspects. The sign up. So you said that if you're on Synergy, you're automatically to Remind. What exactly do you mean on Synergy? Like, is there a specific sign up process for the app? Is there a code you have to join? Like, how exactly does that work? Good question. Not the expert, so maybe yeah. There we go. All right. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Okay. I was looking at you. I didn't. Yeah. 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 No, Appeared yeah. on it. I'm here to back you up, Mark, and thank you for um, all that information. It was awesome. Um, okay. So Synergy is our student information system. So when families register their student for school, they automatically go into Synergy, right? Contact information, etc. All of um, our students' Gmail accounts that they automatically get automatically all pushed into synergy. You want to think of it as a symbiotic relationship. Remind has all the information that Synergy has in regards to contact. Nobody has to do anything. The magic of the technology team does it behind the scenes. And then we utilize that. The beauty of Remind is that even if you don't, if I'm a parent and and sometimes I get lazy and I don't download the app at all, you actually don't even need the app on your phone to receive messages. So the, when you think about Remind, and we're thinking about the cultural responsiveness of this for students and parents, the real idea behind it is how do you make it as simple as possible to communicate without having multiple steps? So technically, you don't even need the app to receive information as a student or a parent. There's no code, there's no sign up. You can download the app, it's not required. So basically what you're saying is every single student who's on Synergy, which is basically every student at MCPS, ha has access to Remind right now. That is correct. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. That's my only question. Monsieur? My question is to Dr. Smith. And 
<laughs> All right, so um, I actually have the pleasure of visiting North Bethesda Middle School this week, and I saw with my own eyes how diverse the student body is. I think about 50% of the students at North Bethesda are students of color. Um, and um, you talk about a wonderful, what sounds like a wonderful panel discussion, and you gave us reflection and action items that came off the panel discussion. So I'm interested in um, scaling something that work, right, in our system. So you, as a school building leader, what, how, what is one thing you can impart to say to have your staff be willing to have this courageous conversation, to examine themselves? Yeah. I think a lot of it is about creating safety, um, people feeling an experience of trust, knowing that we all understand that everybody doesn't have all the answers and everybody's going to make missteps, but it doesn't vilify you. Um, it's an opportunity for us to be vulnerable. So building a climate where there is safety, emotional safety, for staff, students, and parents to share their thoughts openly um, is what I would say is the most important foundation for this kind of work. Mr. Vidavan? Uh I just wanted to commend uh, the system for, for creating this two-way communication. It's something that we've been talking about um, for a long, long time. I just wanted to understand some of the, um, and by the way, uh, I hope your child had a great first week <laughs> in school and you were able to sleep. Um, but I just wanted to know, I know somebody said the timeline is by uh, winter break that all the schools are going to be trained um, on Remind. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, does this include also the Group of students that that is like yes. It, does this include all the pre-K uh, group of students as well? Yes, it includes uh, pre-K, and we're also training central offices office staff as well um, on the utilization of Remind. And do we have any feedback from our educators, from our teachers, on how this is working, and um, how has the the feedback been from them? What's very, and I'll, and I'll turn it over to give feedback from the school, but I will say what's very interesting is that Remind is not new to a lot of our schools and a lot of our staff. Remind has actually been used, and as you know, and we've heard this, and I believe Ms. Evans is on the, was on the communications committee, and Am is on the communication committee. And last year, what we heard a lot of was, you know, from parents and from the committee of, you know, well, my school uses Class Dojo, and my school uses Remind, and my school uses Talking Points. But the thing to remember is that those are the free versions of the, they are free versions. We actually have it, this is a paid version to ensure that all of the data security for Remind is secure. We don't, we don't, we'd prefer people not to use free versions of things. So this is a way to normalize that across the system. So when we introduced this as at the pilot schools, the teachers were thrilled because the capability of it, um, even in comparison to the free version, was so much more. Um, and they use it in a variety of different ways from the teacher level from two-way communication or blasting out messages to emergency messages. So they have been very pleased and I think it's also important to note that the that there were a group of teachers that helped identify this tool because we had a bunch of tools we were looking at. So, But I, Mark can probably speak to the details. Yeah, I, I wanted to add two things. Um, it also uh, communicates with Canvas. So teachers are able to share information on Canvas via Remind. Um, but to your point of it being around for quite some time, our ELD staff um, have been asking for us to have some platform to use two-way communication for quite some time. Talking Points has been one that many people have used. And there was even some, um, I guess, um, reluctance to use uh, Remind uh, this time around because people have been using the uh, free uh, version as opposed to using the, the fully paid version. And so we have a lot more features um, to use uh, using the paid version than the um, free version. And so this, I expect, is going to help us engage our um, newcomer students and our ELD student um, and their families a lot more than we have been able to in the past. 
And just to add to what Mr. Brown said, I think one of the, the key features as we consistently are talking at the table and Dr. McKnight is consistently reiterating the need for accountability, um, the data analytics that this app provides are way farther along than other tools that we use for communication. So we'll really be able to engage in some analysis from the school level to the district level on how this is being used, who it's reaching, who it's not, um, to make sure that we're monitoring our efficacy. Um, Ms. Rivera, I've been, or I think she said she uh, commented on getting feedback from teachers. I encourage you also to get feedback from our multilingual families to see how, how well it's working for them. Absolutely, thank you, and I apologize I didn't answer that one. Um, so we're two weeks in, um, so, but we definitely plan to monitor um, and to get feedback from our uh, staff and our families as well. Um, again, one of the good things is from the two messages that I sent out, I did get a lot of feedback from, from families, just immediate feedback. Yes, yes, as well as thank yous. <laughs> Actually, they all said thank you because my Trans preferred language is English. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, um, I, I actually thought about that when I, I received a, um, a message from a parent, and um, the student is an ELD student, so I was unsure if I should respond in English or in Spanish because, and this is, was just me being presumptuous, in the ELD, uh, ELD1 student, my presumption was that the parent probably has not mastered English either. Uh, so I sent um, an email using Synergy because they didn't want me to text them anymore. Uh, so I used Synergy <laughs> and I used a, a Google Translate. So I sent one in English and a copy of it in Spanish before I realized they responded to me likely in Spanish, I just received sure. it in English. Okay. Yeah, just curious about why they would not want the text messages. Is it because they're buying cards for their cell phones and they get used? I don't know, but yeah. right, not everybody has a cell plan. Some people right. just feed right. the cards for yes. their cell phones. Mrs. Majowski. So I'm not sure who I want to say it to, but after 11 years, <laughs> we're texting people. I'm so excited. I felt like, yes, when you were telling us, I wanted to just applaud. <laughs> and I do really appreciate, I was just going to say, <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a while since my kids were in the schools, but um, even back then it was some schools, I would, I, I'd know what was going on in their classrooms because they'd send text messages. Others I'd never hear anything from. And, and um, I just am very appreciative that in all of our efforts for two-way communication, authentic two-way communication opportunities, we finally have come up with something. So thank you for everybody's work on it. Dr. McKnight, I appreciate us uh, finally getting this going. <laughs> so that's it. So thank you. Yeah. Th and thank you for all this. Hi, Mr. Brown. Go Titans. Um, so um, I just want to say um, how... Um, how grateful I am for all of the hard work. I, I was in 15 schools last week, elementary, middle, and high. And um, in every, every school I went, there was a great energy. Uh, the kids were in class. They weren't wandering around the halls. And, um, and you know, and I, and I just, and, and, you know, all this welcoming, inclusive, affirming work happening, despite all the external noise that I just never hear when I'm inside of our buildings. And so I'm just really grateful for all the work that has gone into that. And um, I also am very grateful to our facility staff, who I know have been, mm -hmm. you know, banging into the walls, you know, 24-7 all summer getting our buildings ready, but still there are always issues in schools and so they're out there working hard you know, dealing with, we're in this heat um, emergency and they, you know, we had to, to close two school, uh, send, sh close two schools early today because of the, the heat, but it was because we're monitoring the situation, we're making the call that's best for students, and we're just we're, we're moving and pivoting in real time to address the situations that we find ourselves in, whatever they are. And I so appreciate the way we are being so, uh, we are really trying to be so very nimble in the way that we that we operate every day to, to try to create the best opportunity um, for students, for staff, for families, and you know achieve the primary goal of teaching and learning. And I want to thank Dr. Barber. Um, I had a chance, I had a great visit um, at Joanne Lilek last week. and. Um, I mean, I think that is 
if it's not one of it's the most diverse. If it's not the most, it's one, certainly one of the most diverse schools in the county. And um, it was just, you know, the, the, the kids were great. They were excited. They were, they were having, we had a, a cricket emergency in one classroom. And, you know, <laughs> the, the AP that's not afraid of bugs ran in there to help, you know, corral the crickets. And, um, it, it, but everybody was having, I mean, I can honestly say the time I spent in that school, it felt like everybody was having a good time. Whatever their role was, the building services team were amazing. All the staff, the kids, the families. It was they were bringing in um, their their incoming pre K students for the for the family visit, where they come in one on one, meet the teachers, see the classroom, and they were all having fun and having a great time. And 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 I just I bring that up in part because it was such a great visit. And I'm so grateful. And to see the way you, Dr. Barber, are using um, your Title One funds to address the unique needs of your school and you really are advocating for them, and um, it, it doesn't look like any other school, and it shouldn't because it looks like your school. And it, it really, it was a great, great visit. And all that to say, because that, that building is um, a challenging building. And there's a reason that that school for the next two years will be going to a holding school, I think it's Fairland, while we build them. A brand new school, which is, I, I'm just flashing back to when we had the presentation um, in the spring, a, a absolutely amazingly beautiful school. But, and, and so, you know, they, they have a challenge because every time we have a community move to a holding school, you have families that they want to COSA out, they want to, they don't want to go through that challenge. But this is such a tight community. I really, um, and staff decide they don't want to, it's no longer convenient for them. Um, to go to the new location, and so, but you're already sort of dealing with those challenges, and I, I was just so impressed. And some of your staff um, pointed out to me inside the original 1952 entry of the building is a beautiful um, art installation that was done by a, a community member who's ni now 90 years old, and this is over 60 years old. And the staff was saying, "We're so sad. We're gonna, we're gonna lose this." And I'm like. I'm on it. And so we, you know, let's not assume that we can't preserve this because it's such an, a, a, a part of the community and the history of the school. So I sent it to Seth Adams. I noticed he's not here, so I won't put him on the spot. But anyway, it is on the radar that we are going to try to preserve this, this beautiful art installation that has been so much a part of your school. So um, anyway, it was just a great visit and so appreciate what you're doing. And, um, and I also want to appreciate um, the work that Dr. Coonan has been doing. But you know we, we've had some some COVID outbreaks, and we have a tight tight messaging. We're getting out. We're addressing it in the same way that we have been. Very evidence based approach. We're you know sending out the messages around the heat alert so everybody knows this is the situation. This is how we're going to deal with it. This is what we're not going to do. This is what we are going to do. And really clear messaging that's really based on the public health and the needs of the community so that our operations are safe. Um, and I just and but that takes work and that takes thought and that takes pre-planning and um, Just so appreciate all of that and I really appreciated you. Mr. Adams saying <coughs> we're moving away from informing It's all about empowering because that that is what the advocates and allies have been saying to us for years um, That's how you create community and that's how you really create tight. That's how you build trust And so I really appreciate what you're doing at North Bethesda around that, too um, because I just um, there are going to people. There are people out there that are never going to have a good thing to say about any of the work that we do. But what I so appreciate it doesn't stop us from doing amazing things and being very responsive to the needs of our community and always admitting what we need to do better and then doing better. You know, figuring out, listening to community. How can we communicate better? And on, I, when I was a teacher in 2018, 2019, we, I used Remind, but it was um, nowhere near the capacity and the capability um, that what we you have. Because of course I was using the free version of the app because that's what we had available. And um, I so appreciate also the the adoption of a system wide process like that that takes into account both the needs of our community and our data security needs because you know we all get very very used to using these communication tools without you know thinking about the security piece the data privacy piece and until something happens and so I really appreciate that we are out in front of that and using this tool so I just am um, 
so thankful for all of the work that you're doing in all the different levels and can't wait to get out to even more schools. Yeah, I'll be really quick. Um, just a point that was mentioned about uh, the uh, upkeep of our schools and everything, and I too want to share my appreciation. The schools that I tour toured last week um, looked fabulous, smelled lovely. It was very exciting, you know, in that kind of heat sometimes. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but um, but I, one of the schools that I visited on Friday, um, you know, they were a little bit short on. Um, support staff, cleaning staff and um, building service managers. And I'm just curious where we are in terms of the hiring um, aspect of that and how we're making sure that we're supporting all of our schools that maybe don't have quite as much staffing support as they need. Yep, so that has also been one of our focuses this year is making sure that we um, staff up the building services as much as possible. There obviously is a lot of attrition in that position. I think at the last I checked, there was about 70 vacancies across the district. Um, and so we continue to hold job fairs and recruit there. Um, but we're certainly in a better position this year than we were last year. I think the number was closer to 100 vacancies as we started school. But you're sending people from central office or something to help schools that maybe need more. Absolutely, yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. Um, so thank you so much for the presentation. I'll try to repeat um, what many of my colleagues have already said, so I do agree with a lot of what I heard. But I did want to repeat this. I wanted to thank Dr. Trimcamp. She's not in here anymore, and her team, because mm -hmm. the piloting of the Remind app was so huge, and it just the pilot just started just late spring, right? So yeah. we just started it, and to hear how um, you're able to use it, Mr. Brown. I appreciate the analytics, because that is helpful, <laughs> right? Um, and I guess this paid version does make a huge difference. Uh, my kids are senior in high school and a junior in college, and so in elementary school, we were using Remind, but not like this. But I, um, I appreciate hearing all that um, it can do, particularly around everybody's automatically in it, right? And then if you want to opt out, you still get emergency. Um, right emails or text messages so that was really great and um i did appreciate being able to go into all of our schools at the beginning of the school week i feel like we've been in school for like two months though, <laughs> I, I agree. i'm just gonna say that i feel like we've been in school for quite some time so i appreciate everybody just making the time for us to come in because i know that although you like for us to be there to hear what's going on and to share um some things that we can do a little bit differently that it is uh is different when we come in there we kind of throw you off a little bit, but I appreciate being able to be in the, the building. So I wanted to go to the parent engagement piece because I do appreciate hearing um, how North Bethesda Middle School is doing around parent engagement and how we're engaging our parents on the Remind app. And um, our community is really great at letting us know when we do do some things really well. And so I just want to give a shout out also, because I know that it's not just happening great at Albert Einstein and North Bethesda Middle School, but at um, Springbrook High School, that they really did a great job of incorporating parent engage, incorporating our parents and the parent in the community into their school improvement um, planning process. And not saying no one else has done that, but we did get feedback from a parent. And I thought it was really powerful because what they said is, you know, so what you actually say is happening at the SIP meetings is actually really happening because I was there, I was able to witness, and we were really made a part of the process and we were able to engage and share our input and we felt valued. So I just wanted to just share a, a bit of that information with our community, with our viewers that are watching, that um, our administrators are doing their best to make sure that the voices of the family members are infused and um, got that email along with other board members and other community members to talk about what that looked like um, at Springbrook High School. So I just wanted to make note of that because it, really, it, it really is important um, for people to know that there's intentionality, right? So I think I said that word a number of times this morning, but I, just, I did want to reiterate that. But it's always good to have our administrators come before us and share the stories and to hear. So just thank you to you all for the work that you will continue to do. Okay. Um, my only comment is, um, you know, two-way communication has been a priority of the board and continues to be a priority of the board. So we really look forward. We were great, as you can as you heard today, we're very excited about this new development with this um, app. 
and um, you know, look forward to hearing from the schools in terms of what other ways you are engaging our families with two-way communication. I did want to ask a question. Um, it's more of a, uh, just as a reminder that one other c a priority of the board is not only staff recruitment, like we heard from Ms. Key, but retention. And that's why I asked for the retention data. And so just making sure that we're keeping an eye, not only in bringing in great people, but how do we uh, keep uh, these great people that have gone through all this great training and professional development and so forth. So she shared uh, the statistics uh, in terms of the state average, what it was for last year and what it is for this year. And so that's another priority of the board that we will be monitoring this year. And finally, I am, um, you know, as, as you all have heard, the board tried to put in additional consulting teachers into the budget, but that it didn't make it through. But that's still a concern because we have a lot of new to the profession teachers. And that just means the caseload is bigger for our wonderful consulting teachers. So it was a concern when we were doing the budget. It continues to be a concern. And I'm sure that you are doing everything you can to support our new to the profession. But that's a, you know, it's just something that um, I'm cognizant of. New to the profession teachers need a lot more support than your average um, new to MCPS teacher. So with that, I will stop. And Dr. McKnight, you have your light on. Yes, I just want to uh, say, as we talk about the budget and the upcoming budget in all of our conversations, we're preparing now, right, for December. Um, Remind has been one of the uh, things that we've identified as a cost saving for us in FY25. So we can talk more about that. Um, but it's great to be able to have a product that works and furthers our priority and at the same time, allow us to save money. So that's a piece that we can come back to and look at what that savings is. And I did want to just thank our principals. Um, we started this conversation talking about the main thing being our main thing, and that is that our children are successful in our schools. There are a lot of things that surround protecting that our student success is centered in why we are all here. So I want to thank you for all the things that you've done from the academic performance to the galvanizing of the community to help them be a part of the school that all contributes to, at the end of the day, the success of our students. And so the way you have eloquently shared your stories, your accounts, your vignettes, experiences have just made the conversation so valuable. So I just want to thank you, encourage you to continue as you share your stories. I know many of our other principals are listening and will be following up you know, to ask questions about your practices that are successful. So thank you so much for all that you're doing for your leadership. Much appreciate it. Thank you. And so uh, we are not going to move on to our next agenda item. And it's a... Well, actually, we're still on the same agenda item. <laughs> we didn't finish that presentation. Oh, I'm that sorry. was the appendix. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I wanted to continue. Pardon me. <laughs> Pardon me. Pardon me. That was the end of it. Thank you, Ms. Sylvester. I thought we were going to talk about professional development to tie it all up, but yes. Thank you. You are right, Ms. Sylvester. The next item. Yeah, the next item is agenda <laughs> item number eight. And that, like Dr. McKnight said, our main thing is our main thing, and that is student achievement. And we are thrilled to have uh, results of our first uh, dibbles. Uh, <laughs> implementation, I don't know what the right word is. And so I will pass it on to Dr. McKnight to get us started uh, to get this uh, view into how our students did with this assessment. Okay, thank you, President Silvestri. So we're going to keep on with the theme of our main thing is our main thing, and that's student academic success. Um, perfect way into the segue. This year, you're actually going to have a number of presentations. This is the first of several presentations we're going to have related to the academic milestones and our pathways of college, career, and community readiness. Um, you know, I always pause when I say that because I'm just so excited about the fact that 
we have this outward accountability model that really speaks to the progression of our students. And the benchmarks in there really indicate how we're doing academically. So the first academic milestone within the pathway is early literacy. And as you mentioned, um, Ms. Silvestri, we often refer to our Dibbles data to give us an understanding of that um, and lectura scores to look at our students in kindergarten. And that's what we did in the 22-23 school year. Today you're going to hear the team talk about the emphasis on the importance of early literacy. This is going to be um, very important that we continue to look at early literacy because of course when our students are successful in early literacy, then we are looking to close less gaps later as they progress in their academic career in Montgomery County. And so today they're going to talk about collaboration across offices and schools and how we are going to support or will continue to support the staff and the students in reaching those academic milestones that are in the pathways for college career and community readiness. And so um, we have, again, an opportunity to highlight some work that's happening in our district. We're going to welcome some more principals to the table today. Um, we have our principal of Belpre Elementary, Ms. Dara Brooks, and our principal, um, one of my former feeder principals, Ms. Erica Williams from Fields Road Elementary, um, who are joining us today and will be able to share an account of, of their work. And so thank you again ahead of time for coming and sharing your stories with us to make sure that we understand how the implementation plays out um, as boots on the ground. And thank you so much. I won't talk about the data that we ended the year with, because you, you, you will share that as a part of this presentation. But remember, one of the celebrations when we looked at the progression of student learning from the beginning of last year to the end of the year was profound. We, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Just steal your talking points. But um, I'm going to hand it over to the team quickly. But I just want to reiterate. The science of reading work is the right work. For us to see results this swiftly and this quickly, especially after the pandemic, speaks volumes to why we have to stay the course. Training the teachers on it, I mean, I've been in those classrooms talking to those teachers. They are excited about it. We're seeing the, the, the um, actual progress happening in our results, and we're going to continue doing that. And I want to thank the team because they were so, so dedicated to this and planned out, um, Ms. Brown, you know, the great professional development this summer for our teachers. Um, and it was truly engaging. And I'm going to go back to it's always an opportunity to get better. We heard from our staff that we needed to um, really look at the training that we were providing to them. And it needed to be more robust, more interactive, and that's exactly what we provided. And this year we got a lot of positive feedback from the teachers about that training as well. So in the mind of continuing to get better every day um, is exactly what the team has modeled in this work, and I want to thank you for that. So at this time, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Pugh, to get the presentation started. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. Members of the board, we're really, really happy to be here um, to talk about the first data point in our new pathway to college and career and community readiness. Next slide, please. So we really thought hard about, you know, the purpose of this new pathway is to make sure that we were fully transparent and that the information was meaningful and that families could understand where their children were and that it was easy to communicate in one language. As you know, education is full of education ease. We use a lot of technical language, but I think this is a really, really good um, start to being very clear using single data points. So we know we're going to do this over and over a few times uh, due to the board's agenda to make sure that we're looking at data as it is ready. And we wanted to put together a sequence so that we could repeat the sequence using whatever data points we were using. So the intentionality around this is that it is all part of the pathway to college career and community readiness. It begins today with the very first indicator that's on that um, pathway, the Dibbles assessment. But people ask, what is that? And, and what does that measure? And um, how do I know how to interpret that? So we'll give a little bit of information about that, what the assessment is, what our data are, what they were at the beginning, what they were at the end of last year. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the uh, next steps but we'll ground it in how schools really use the information because that's where the rubber hit the road. They actually took advantage of the information that they had on every individual student, made changes, and we, we saw significant gains. And we'll let, we'll let them tell their stories about how they were able to do that. Um, next slide, please. You were ready. I'm so excited. <laughs> 
So the next slide shares the um, visual that you've all seen about the pathway to college career and community readiness. And what we're talking about today are the academic indicators. Again, the first one being the early literacy skills in kindergarten. The data point that we're going to talk about today is from what children in kindergarten last year earned. So this is our last year's beginning of year and end of year data, because that'll tell a complete story and we'll be able to sh share with you some information about the growth. But before we get started, there is an assessment that happens prior to the um, Dibbles assessment when students enter our door, and that's the kindergarten readiness assessment. And that's a, an assessment that assesses four areas, including literacy. So physical development, motor development, social emotional development, and literacy and math. So it is important to know that they're going to share data about how our children started the year in Dibbles. It aligns very, very closely with the data that we got on the kindergarten readiness assessment where only 44% of our children entered kindergarten ready to learn. So what I hope you'll see in the story is a huge success, success of the team, success of the teachers, success of the schools. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Brown to tell the story. Thank you, Dr. Pugh. Um, good afternoon, Dr. McMahon, and Ms. Bestry, and members of the board. I am Malika Brown. I'm the el el elementary English language arts supervisor. Um, so as you've heard, we use, if we can go to the next slide, um, we use the Dibbles assessment, the dynamic indicator of basic literacy skills, and lectura in grades kindergarten through second grade to measure those critical early literacy skills for students. Um, before we get into the data, I just wanted to give a quick reminder of like what Ms. Pugh said, what Dibbles is and how we use it. So the assessment, um, it has uh, a set of components, a set of subtests and measures. And so as you see here um, for Dibbles, it has a letter naming fluency. And so basically what that measures is students um, naming upper and lowercase letters. Um, phonemic segmentation, they're given a word and they have to say the sounds in the word. Tell me the sounds in the word sat, s, at. Um, nonsense word fluency is decoding nonsense words. So um, they could, they'll see a word and it'll, uh, nonsense, a, a nonsense word. And so they'll have to either say the sounds or hap. They can read the word. Um, oral reading fluency, they're given a, uh, a set of sentences um, that are connected and they would have to read those. And then for maze, it's our comprehension measure. Uh, they're given a passage. The seventh word of each sentence is omitted and replaced with three options. The student has to give um, the, the correct option. Um, just to note, uh, the word reading fluency and oral reading fluency are only assessed in uh, first first and second grade, and our maze is only assessed in um, a comprehension measure that is only assessed in second grade. And so the whole idea of the reason why behind our Dibbles and Lectura is because what it does, it's a strong connection, connection to the work that we're doing, again, around early literacy, and it aligns with the shift that we're making to structure literacy. The components um, that are, and you'll see in a moment, the components that the subtests relate to are the five components of um, effective literacy instruction that we know that is essential and necessary in order to develop skilled readers. When we're thinking about our phonemic awareness, our phonics, our fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. So these subtests align directly to those components of reading um, that were outlined that are based in the science of reading research that were also highlighted and noted in the National Reading Panel report. If we go to the next slide. So again, you saw the subtest on the previous slide. Um, and so here, here are the ones that, how they align to um, the five components of reading. So um, they include its ph uh, phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, and comprehension. There is a subtest that measures vocabulary. However, that's not one of the required measures that we use. Um, it is available um, for teachers to continue to collect additional data, but it is not one of the required measures. Only the four that you see in red, those are the ones that we use. And so all of this data that's collected, um, they're used, uh, teachers use that data to then um, inform their next steps, their small group instruction, and then uh, to be responsive to what is being demonstrated by the students. We can go to the next slide. The next slide. 
So again, Dibbles focuses on the critical early literacy skills that we know are necessary and essential for reading success. Um, it was also developed at, to serve as an indicator of um, reading risk, um, as well as to, again, um, monitor progress over the course of the year um, in overall reading for K-2. The Spanish component, lectura, that's our authentic Spanish assessment. And th so that's used to measure the early literacy skills for students that are learning to read in Spanish that are part of our two-way and our one-way immersion programs. So those students will take both um, dibbles as well as lectura. So we're measuring the work that they're, they're, they're learning around early literacy in English. And for the two-way immersion, we're also measuring their early literacy growth and progress in Spanish as well. We can go to the next slide. The data. Yes, very excited. They told me to make sure I smile. Um, so when we look at our overall K-2 data, we can see an increase in the percent of students meeting either the Dibbles or the Lectura benchmark from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. And so this is our full uh, K-2 data. We thought even, although the milestone represents um, kindergarten, we thought it was important to include all of our K-2 data to start to give you a full sense of what primary literacy looks like here in MCPS. So you can see from the beginning of the year for kindergarten, so this was last uh, school year, we have a 24 percentage point increase from the beginning to end. For first grade, we have a 17 percentage point increase. And then for our second grade, we have a 10 percentage point increase. I do want to um, have us think about it through the lens. So the, the benchmark changes from the beginning of the year, it increases from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. So for kindergarten, exa for example, um, the, in order to meet the benchmark, a student has to score, has to have a score of 306 or higher in order to be determined as meeting. By the end of the year, they have to score a 420. So it's not the same thing. Because a student meets at the beginning of the year, there isn't a guarantee that they're also going to meet at the end of the year. They will continue to need um, that ongoing, explicit instruction in foundational skills in order to meet. And so it really speaks to the work that teachers are doing, how they're being responsive, and how they're ensuring that, again, that the students are receiving that explicit instruction. We can go to the next slide. So here, digging into our kindergarten data. So again, as you can see, um, we have 72% of all of our kindergarten students that either score at or above the benchmark. When we look um, at race and ethnicity, um, we can see that at least 70% of our Asian, our black African American, our two or more races, and our white students scored at or above the benchmark. We do see that our Hispanic Latino students, they're 55% um, of that group scored at or above the benchmark, but there is still some celebration. And so you can see when it's broken down, when we're looking at um, that growth from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. So we'll go to the next slide. So here, we break it down a little <coughs> further. And so we're looking at where our students were by subgroup at the beginning and where they are, where they ended um, last school year in the spring. So you can see that uh, there is a notable increase for our Hispanic Latino students um, with a 29.4 percentage point increase. And what that really speaks to is the work in our schools. Schools are collecting that early data in the fall and they are responding to that data by ensuring that the students have an receiving that explicit instruction in their foundational skills. So still continuing to do that work um, in order to ensure that our students are, are making the progress, at least a year's worth of progress in, during the school year. If we can go to the next slide. Yep. And I will turn it over to Ms. Hewlett. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tamara Hewlett. I am the director of the Department of English Learners and Multilingual Education. And as Ms. Brown just took us through our racial demographic data, I will be taking us through our service groups. Um, so we, again, we saw that all kindergartners uh, were scoring at a 72% on the Dibbles or Lectura assessment. Um, at, uh, just a reminder, our Lectura assessment is uh, the assessment that is given in Spanish at our two-way immersion schools, six sites, and our uh, one-way immersion Spanish schools, three sites. So when we look at the service groups, we are thinking Dibbles and Lectura, 
our emergent multilingual learners scored at 51% across all 137 elementary schools. Um, our students receiving free and reduced meals, they scored at a 58% meeting um, the target. And for students receiving special education services who took the assessment, uh, they scored at a 52%. Um, 52% uh, of our students scored, uh, met the target. If we could go to the next slide, please. And so here we see where they started the beginning of the year and how they ended the year. So we see that our students who received free and reduced meals and our emergent multilingual learners, they had almost a 27 percentage point increase, um, maintaining and growing, meeting those targets, uh, as well as our students receiving special education services. Uh, they grew uh, in uh, their, the uh, proficiency at a, a rate of about 13.3%. Next slide, please. And so one of the things that's incredibly important is to ensure that our families have an understanding of how, and they're notified of how students are doing. So here you'll see our Home Connect report. The Home Connect report is shared with families after each testing window. So there's one that goes home in the fall, in the winter, and in the spring. And it includes information on what the student's composite score was, so their overall score, as well as the scores for some of those subtests that I referenced earlier in the presentation. This report is shared with families both in English and Spanish, um, and there's also an accompanying letter that is provided to schools to share with the families that supports them with interpreting the information on the report. There's also, um, as part of the report, a set of activities that families can use with the family, um, sorry, with their students based on the needs of the, um, the students, are, the needs of the students are demonstrating. Um, in addition to that, um, in, if families need additional information around how their students are doing or how to interpret the report, they can check in with their uh, the teacher as well as the reading specialist. One of the things that we're going to continue to do is um, to not only make sure that the letters are going home consistently after each administration, but also um, supporting stu uh, schools with those best practices to ensure that families um, understand what the data is telling them. And so, and it's really, really important for us um, to make sure that that happens. We can go to the next slide. And so and finally, um, we wanted to just take a moment to share the work that we have done, um, the work that we uh, are going to continue to do, and some things that we're going to put in place um, as well in order to support our theory of action when we're considering uh, differentiated resources and supports, um, continuing to build that staff capacity um, as well, and our accountability structures. So um, one of the very, very exciting parts is we uh, all of the cross office teams really look at how we are approaching school support. And it's not this, you know, one uh, size fits all, but we're really dif differentiating the support to schools based on their needs. And so really looking at their data, really looking at their staffing to determine who needs what type of support. Um, the other thing that's been, that's, and um, it's going to speak to what you were saying, Ms. Um, Mdrowski, about the learning for uh, paraeducators. Um, so we added um, eight 88 uh, paraeducator allocated hours uh, to focus on literacy in 82 of our elementary schools. There's a specialist on the elementary ELA team that will work uh, provide ongoing support to those paraeducators. Um, so we actually had a meeting this morning to share that with principals. They'll have seven professional learning opportunities around early literacy um, um, with the, from the specialists on our team. And that specialist will also be available to work with them in schools, looking at the data, looking at the interventions that they're going to be implementing, um, modeling lessons, giving them feedback. And so they will receive that ongoing um, learning around how to effectively deliver um, literacy instruction. Um, building capa staff capacity, um, as Dr. McKnight uh, 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 shared um, at the start, this summer we provided professional learning for 3,125 of our elementary educators, it's about 88%. Um, it was 
a labor of love. Um, we did it the entire summer. Uh, they had the opportunity to attend two days of training. And the exciting part, it was a little different than what we've typically done. Uh, we provided choice. There were seven workshops all around the components of effective literacy instruction that educators could select from. Um, so if they wanted to go to a session on phonemic awareness, they wanted to go to a session on fluency, um, they had the option to be able to do that because they were building the capacity. They determined their needs and they build their capacity around that. Um, one of the required session, though, because of our continued focus, the continued work that we're doing, was um, fo it focused on our emerging multilingual learners. So everyone had to attend a session um, a vocabulary development for emerging multilingual learners. So they were actually able to pick three of the four. Um, in addition to that, um, our team works very closely with the reading specialists in our elementary schools, and so that's going to be ongoing work. They also had a session um, learning this summer that was kind of like a follow-up carryover to what the teachers were engaging in, as how do now how do we move from learning to doing? How do I take the learn? How do teachers take the learning that they've been presented with to actually inform and change their practice? So that's the work that we're going to continue to do with our reading specialists and supporting and coaching their teachers. You learned all this. You just didn't get to go spend, you know, spend two days of summer training um, just because you had nothing else to do this summer. It's really how do I allow the, what I've learned to then inform my teaching practices. And then um, as a way to continue to ensure those accountability structures, um, we started it last year, really getting in and visiting classrooms. So we were able to get to um, 34 schools last year um, and visit a classroom K1 and 2. This year, we want to continue and even expand on that. So really getting into those classrooms, really seeing um, instruction, really getting into planning meetings, and so which will help us to determine what does this shift actually look like in the classroom? Our what 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 is the state of the teacher practice? What is the state of instruction? So that we can continue to ensure that every single elementary educator, they have the skills, the knowledge, and the capacity, the capacity to be an effective teacher of literacy. If we can go to the next slide. And so, um, as we mentioned, we do have some school, uh, two of our schools here. Um, Belpre Elementary School, we have um, uh, where is she? There she is, Ms. Star Brooks, um, who's a principal. And then we also have Ms. Tracy Dupree, who is our reading specialist. And then from Fields Road Elementary School, we have Ms. Erica Williams. And the former reading specialist, but she's still here because it's really important for her to be here, um, Ms. Katie Kelly. And the reason that we wanted to highlight um, these two schools is when we looked at their data, the tremendous gains that they made. So both schools have above 70% of their students meeting the benchmark. In addition to that, so not just meeting, when we looked at their from fall to uh, spring data, they both have at least a 25 percentage point increase. And that really speaks to just the clear uh, structures that they have in place, the effective coaching and support that's being provided to teacher. teachers, just to ensure, again, that the practices that the teachers are utilizing every single day in the classroom aligns with what the research tells us about how children learn to read. So thank you all so much for being she here. Thank you all for the work and just the, the ongoing and continued partnership that we have. We can go to the next slide. And so from there, I'll turn it over uh, to you for a discussion. Thank you. I'll ask my colleagues to turn their lights on if they have any questions. Ms. Rivetta Oven. Thank you so much uh, for that. Um, I, I do have some questions um, on, on, I guess, a couple on the process and some on the data. Um, so how many kids are we talking about? How many kids, every kindergarten participated in this? Okay, so how many kids are, there? just help me out because I'm. So we have about 11,000 kindergarten students. Okay, so 11,000? Yes. And then you have the breakdown of demographics for those 11,000? I don't have that all, um, with me, but that's definitely something that we can, so we can see the, the number of students for each um, race and ethnicity. That's Absolutely. Yeah. As well as service groups, if that's what you're. Yeah, that, yep. that, yep. that would be. Isn't that in the appendix? Um, what's in the see. appendix, not the number of students, but it has its first and second grade data. Um, but it's broken yeah. out by uh, percentage, but I would like yeah. the numbers. The actual number. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I'm really bad at percentages, okay? Didn't do very well in math. But um, so I'm, I'm, you know, just give me the numbers, like 11,000, you know, 6,000 are Latino students, you know, that would be really helpful uh, for me. Um, for, I'm trying to understand the process for the, for the ELD students, for the, for the ESOL. Sorry, that's usually a lot of people know uh, that better than ELD. Students, the process of the testing. So help me understand. So if you are in a dual program, then you will get the test in Spanish and English to, to, to recognize the words, right? And also if you are, what, what is the other program that we have? The one-way immersion. The one-way immersion, you will get that. So if that's drop of the draw sometimes, right? So if you live like Gaysesburg Elementary is now a great program, a majority of those kids come speaking Spanish as their first language. So those kids will get tested with this, right? But if you're a regular ESL kid like myself when I started at Washington Grove Elementary, right, and you're not in one of those programs, you will not get tested that way, correct? Correct. Correct. Um, we are, the lectura exam, we, we try to assess students in the language of instruction. And so to a immersion program, the students are being instructed in Spanish. They get instructed, they get assessed in Spanish as well. Uh, one way immersion, those three programs, they get assessed in Spanish. We have been, our two teams have been talking about making the assessment accessible to emerging multilingual learners across the district. And we recognize that they're is going to be a need, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of data you can get f from a, 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 an incoming kindergartner who languages in Spanish primarily, and you can get a lot of information of, as to what, needs, what just needs to transfer to English and what needs to be taught. Um, and so that's, that's ongoing work uh, for our teams, and we recognize that those schools have to have teachers or staff members who can provide that assessment in that language as well. So you know where I'm going with this, right? <laughs> um, so the public is where I'm going with this is that you could have a child who might not be at a proficiency of reading level in English, but might be at a very high proficiency level in reading in Spanish, right? right? So how, mm -hmm. you, how, you, how you assess that, right? Uh, but there's no room for that. And that's why I wanted to get the, the numbers of, of really how many kids we're talking about. Um, I know that, and this is many moons ago, um, my kids' first language at home was Spanish. Um, even though, you know, they were born at Shady Grove Hospital, but their first language, you know, was Spanish. And two of them was actually Slovenian in Spanish, just to make it more, more fun. Um, so, Correct me if I'm wrong now, when they get the testing, it's, it's on an iPad, right? Is it not an iPad? It's, does it have like a... It's, it's not on an iPad. Um, it's it's right. Right. Oh, let me oh. Turn mine sorry. Um, it's teacher administered. So four of the six measures are administered one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and then the other two measure can be d measures can be administered either in small group or whole group where they're on their Chromebooks and they will be able to respond. So the majority of the test is done one-on-one -on -one with the teacher. Yes. Do the kids who are ESL, do they get any extra time to take that? Or is this, you use the same time for everybody? So that is part of what makes it, uh, validates the assessment. It is timed. And so four of the measures, it's one minute. Because part of when we're thinking about um, what's needed to become a skilled reader, it is around that fluency. And so we recognize 100% what that means for our students uh, that are receiving special education services or EMLs. So the time is a factor. And so what our teachers do is, well then, Yes, I recognize that they may have it, but they may not have it be able to demonstrate it within the time, so that informs their small group instruction. Okay, we need to work a little bit more on fluencies, fluency in addition to word recognition or phonemic um, segmentation. I don't want to put any of the principles on this part, but I, I'm very concerned, especially about our Latino population with the numbers that they actually scored lower 
than any other group, and yet they're the largest group of kids that we have in our system in, in kindergarten. If, and some of you had such great success in bringing it up, and you have a large population, the one I'm talking about, I would like to hear from you, what is it that you guys, what did you do specifically that we can bottle that, okay, and, and take it around, around, around um, other MCPS schools to bring, because that was a significant achievement, um, and you guys have almost the same resources, so I'm just curious. Yeah. Whoever would like to come, I shall move over. I think. Oh, both. Yeah, you can both come. Yeah, both. That'd be great. You just push the button. Yeah. Okay. Um, good afternoon, uh, Dr. McKnight and Silvestri and board members. First of all, I just want to start by saying thank you for this recognition. Um, on behalf of Belpre Elementary School, my staff, we're so proud. And I, I, I think they're having a watch party. I hope school's <laughs> 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 But um, I told them not to make sure the students get home. But one of the things... <laughs> One of the things that we um, were really intentional about this past year was, uh, or last year, was to have a multi-tiered system of support. And so to your, your question, uh, we wanted to make sure that we were reimagining our intervention processes. So we changed it from interventions to accelerated instruction. So the teachers weren't academic intervention teachers. They were accelerated instruction teachers. And so we were very intentional about calling it accelerated instruction because we knew we had 182 days in the school year. We really wanted to be intentional about providing at least six weeks on a, on a cyclical basis. So they had the fall administration, then they would receive accelerated instruction. And so that accelerated, accelerated instruction looked like sound partners, um, RG, uh, really great reading, and Orton Gillingham if needed. And so <clears throat> we were... We wanted to, again, just emphasize the fact that we have a very limited amount of time. Research-based interventions, which these are, have to be given within a short amount of time, and we want to see what the return is on the investment of time, what the return is on the investment of this, you know, the, the monies that have been put into the resources. And so there would be a, an entry test. They would um, see where they were placed. They would receive the accelerated instruction for six straight weeks and then we would give them an exit test to see where they um, landed and so the intent was to make sure that they were exited out of this acceleration block so that we could make room for students who needed and so I'm um, kind of going back to your question we really were intentional about providing our students who are emerging multilingual students um, the dibbles the the um, phonemic awareness and seeing where they were and how they how they ended and to make sure that we gave it to them every single day for the six week cycle so that was one of the things that we did at our school we also had a lot of data conversations um, on a quarterly basis to see where students were um, falling in terms of not only the uh, phonemic awareness or the decoding, but also the comprehension. And so all of that kind of worked together uh, for our good, as you can see from the data. <laughs> good afternoon to the members of the board. Dr. McKnight, thank you for allowing me to be here on behalf of Fields Road and our hardworking and committed staff. Um, when you talk about, you know, what are some best practices that we um, implemented last school year, I would say that we are a school where we do not have as many extra resources. Um, we do not have as many staff members as some schools. And um, last year, I think, along with a lot of other schools, our staffing was rather limited and short. So I would say that one thing that we really did, and to help our um, EML students as well, is that we really had to focus in on that good quality first instruction because we didn't have several people to do interventions um, throughout the day. And so I would say that we we're very lucky that our school, uh, our staff, our teachers really embraced um, the RGR program. 
and they did it with fidelity and it was consistent every day. No matter when you, if you wanted to come over and observe literacy, of course they had the other parts, you know, for structurers, but anytime we went in there, they were really focused on those foundational skills. And um, what they did, we also with the planning that we did, again, gives the limited resources. So we met weekly as a core team, reading specialist, staff development, staff development teacher, um, counselor, myself, assistant principal, and we really uh, monitored our literacy data on a continuous basis. And we also had to rethink about the time that we were spending, uh, because this was new to a lot of our staff members. So when we think about um, Dibbles, even like the data analysis, like it's one thing to administer um, the assessment, but then to go back and to monitor it for data analysis and try to schedule the small groups and decide on who fits into which group, um, what we had to do was um, usually, I would say previously, we would say, oh, you know, the teachers need training in this. And so we would do it at one of our staff meetings where we had PD. But I would say that last year we were very intentional of thinking that that might not be enough for our teachers. And so what we did was I worked very closely with uh, my former reading specialist, <laughs> Ms. Kelly. We're still on very excellent terms. We love each other. It's another setting. So we worked very closely last year and um, decided that we would have more bang for our buck if we went to each of the collaborative planning meetings. You know, go to kindergarten, focus just on them in that small setting. Same thing for first and second grade. That way it was a smaller setting, an opportunity uh, where people could feel comfortable as their teammates. If they don't understand how to look at the Dibbles analysis, that was a time where they felt more comfortable asking questions. And um, Ms. Kelly could also take the time to go through and make sure that they were organizing the student groups effectively um, and that we were grouping students who, were, who may have been strong in foundational skills, that they had their group as well as those who needed more support. And um, we also met the reading specialist and myself, Ms. Kelly, um, to make sure that we were on the same page with our messaging to staff and that you know we had a shared vision, which we did for the reading program. And so we did tell teachers that you know they needed bi-weekly progress monitoring. Um, Ms. Kelly then went in again to show them exactly how to do the progress monitoring, answer any questions that they had. And so a lot of it is just the intentional use of the collaborative planning time with great level teams and then also the staff's commitment um, to working on those foundational skills as a part of first instruction on a daily on a daily basis. They were very happy to have that program to the point where they said, you know, we're hearing some changes may happen uh, with the with the literacy curriculum. Um, but they said if it does and they try to take, you know, really great reading away, is there any way that we can like secretly do it here? Because we've had so much success with it. And they have fun with it. The students have fun with the program and um, Although we had EML, I would say, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but I know for our EML students, you know, we may have been talking about really only like maybe 20% of them, you know, in kindergarten, first and second grade at the beginning of the year, um, meeting proficiency on with the benchmark. But, you know, by the end of the year, yes, we still need growth, but, you know, we had jumped from 20-something or 25 up to, like, 50, and 50-some 50 percent for that group or close to 60. And I think a lot of that had to do with really just the, the daily first instruction and having a commitment as a school to working on those skills and to have flexible groups, always progress monitoring, always figuring out what those groups are um, and how we should pull them. And then if someone had any kind of difficulty with small group instruction, you know, going to the classroom and again, the reading specialist was there to provide that training and um, on the spot support. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, since you were very deliberate, the last question I had was out of the 11,000 kindergartens, do you guys have the data on how many had pre-K? And is there any correlation with the groups that are doing really well who had pre-K? Do you 
do you benchmark or is there any uh, direct data to show that the students who had pre-K, even in the groups um, who are farms and so on, is there any significant difference with those who did not? So, um, as Dr. P mentioned, we do have the kindergarten readiness assessment um, that, you know, and it, one of the components that's measured is early literacy. Um, we have not sort of triangulated that um, in terms of looking at students who had prior, their prior preschool um, or pre-K and M had started in MCPS. I mean, that's something that we can definitely look, to look at to see the impact. One of the things that we do, um, our team does is we work closely with Pre-K Head Start. Um, we provide professional learning um, in collaboration to our Pre-K Head Start teachers as well. Um, they also had summer training to, you know, to continue to build their capacity around early literacy um, so that they, you know, so that their students aren't getting just started in kindergarten. This work is, um, it begins in, in Pre-K. Thank you. I want to thank you for the presentation. Um, you know, these are great aggregate numbers, but I would like to get the data broken down by school, by race, and by, um, you know, our, our emergent multilingual learners, farms, and special ed groups. Thank you. And I, and I want to commend our two principals. Okay. That is an excellent, excellent job. Ms. Harris, yes, um, back on. <laughs> Whoops, sorry. Um, I had a question on slide 11. If they can pull that back up, please. And um, while they're doing that, I did have a question. And, and Ms. Williams, I think you may have gotten to this a little bit. Um, it, during the presentation, at one point you were talking about the Home Connect reports, and I think you said that these go home three times a year right after the assessment period. So are the Dibbles and the Lectura, are those given three times a year? And so how much time does it take to administer? So if I'm a, uh, uh, if I'm a kindergarten teacher and I'm administering this test three times a year, how much time does it take out of my, my instruction to administer these exams three times a year? So it's each measure is about one minute per student. Um, and so if I have a class of 18 or if I have a class of 20 uh, or a class of 15, that will vary. Um, but each one is a minute. And then the, there, the two, there's two of them that's primarily it's the ones in uh, first and second grade. Those can be done in small group. Um, they're not one-on-one -on -one or they can be done whole class. Um, so it's about 25, but it's also done over the course of the window. So our window opens, it actually opened on Monday and it runs through October 7th. So it's not, they just do assessments, assessments, assessments. They, in, it's part of also ensuring that instruction continues to happen. They break it up over the course of the four to six weeks that the window is open. So these assessments can be broken in Absolutely, yes. It's not all at once. Absolutely, yes, it's not all at once. Um, and then, um, so looking at this slide, um, the data piece, and uh, this is percentage of kindergartners meeting Dibbles or Lectura. Do, what, is, what, do, what does the data look like as far as, is, there, is this disaggregated? Do, you know, are, how many students do well on one and not the other, I guess is what I'm trying to ask. So reported in the data set for our two-way immersion schools and our one-way immersion Spanish sites, the lectura data is what's represented. Okay. Rep represented. So we don't have any groups of students that are taking both? We do have students taking both. <laughs> um, all of the students at the two-way immersion schools and the one-way because of the Ready to Read yeah. Act and for kindergarten, they, they have to take both. Yes. So they're taking both. Um, but what's reported in this in these data is that the for those nine sites, the lectura data is representative of what the how the kindergartners scored, and the dibbles data is representative of the other uh, 120. Let me do my math. <laughs> the the remainder of the schools. Okay, so we're not reporting. So for the the students in the nine schools that are either in the one way or two way immersion, we are only reporting their lectura. Yes. So we're, they're taking dibbles, but yes. we're not reporting that. For kindergarten. For kindergarten. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And I, I just want to say that for, 60, for two way immersion, uh, our students scored at a 67 percentage uh, uh, met. Uh, uh, point. So 67% of kindergartners who took lectura in two-way immersion, they met or exceeded the benchmark. And so you have to think those students are learning in two languages, and 67% of them on lectura was able to demonstrate um, proficiency by the end of the year on lectura. Um, and then the other question I have is on slide 13. And that is, you mentioned that, um, so in the slide it talks about um, one of the differentiate, the theory of action pieces, differentiate resources and support, um, implement foundational literacy, pair educator support in 88 schools. It says 88 here, but you said 83. It's actually 82 schools. Okay. Um, some, we have a couple of schools that have split the position, and so not just having one person in the position, they have two people in the position, so it's 88 positions 82 schools and how did we determine which 88 schools received the additional that's support? a great question um, at the end of this year last year um, we looked at the, their spring actually we looked at their whole the full year's worth of yep. data um, and their map data as well we looked at their demographics because we really wanted to be intentional about where that support would be to, you know to make a difference and so that's how that's why we came up with how we identified the the 82 school um, this position has been around in the past um, we, oh, I'm just that loud that it was <laughs> not even needed. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, um, we had it in about, I think it was about 40 or so schools. Um, but again, when we think about the shifts that we're making, wanting to ensure, um, you know, when we're thinking about our, our anti-racist audit, you know, those populations of students who were not, who, who need that additional support, those schools that need that additional support, um, all of that was a factor in determining and expanding the list of schools that would receive it. So last last year, about 40 schools had this position. Something like that. Like, I don't yeah. remember the exact number. And then, yes, know, based on additional funding, continue to look at the data, we increased that. And so I'm assuming, does that mean that when you looked at the, so last year, the schools that had that additional support, did their data support that, did their data show that that intervention was actually improving outcomes? I, I did not look at the data that way. I looked, I used last year's data to see where students were falling to determine what we would do for this year. I did not match up um, for the schools that did have it, what, how their students perform. Um, and the reason that I didn't is because the level and the intensity around the partnership, um, that's happening um, for, the, uh, for this school year. It wasn't something that we had really organized um, last year. And so, yeah. So I, I'm, so I guess as we start looking at this data coming in, absolutely having a, uh, you know, shining a light or, or indicating which schools have that additional mm -hmm. pair educator support, I think would be helpful, especially yes. when we're going to be looking at, under quite the microscope this year, what's working, what's not, when we're deciding about making and, budget decisions. And that's part of what we we're going to we plan on doing as well because we want to make sure that it's. It's having an impact, um, you know, on, on student achievement. And then if it's working in schools, you know, how budget can we can continue to expand um, across more schools? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Ms. Yang? Yes, uh, thank you so much. The, um, I have heard anecdotal sharing with me from teachers that they love the really great reading. They think it's a great curriculum. They love the script. They love the slides. They love all the extensions that it provides. Now, my question is, so was Dibble's data collected last year, or was it this the first year you collect the data? So last school year, the 22-23, was the first year that we collected Dibble, Dibble system-wide. Um, the previous year, we did it with the nine pilot schools, um, just as a you know uh, informal way because we also had MAPRF. Um, but last year was the first year that we implemented it system-wide. Okay. So and and this data is from spring uh, from fall to spring, right? This data. Yes. Is, is last, last school year. year. Mm -hmm. Last school. Yes. So they're currently actually, in those so, window for this year. So yeah, I yes. was trying to get if uh, we have data because we see such great growth. I was wondering whether we have data to compare from before. So as you say, we don't have. So this is our baseline uh, of of this year. So in the future year, we can see whether interventions or other uh, implementation or practice training will make a difference in shifting the data. Thank you. Okay. 
Well, um, seeing no other lights on, I want to thank you so much for the presentation. I think this is a great start to our data monitoring, progress monitoring uh, processes for our agenda meetings. And so thank you so much. And we're going to take a 10-minute break. Uh, we will be back at 4 o'clock. Thank you.
So we are going to um, come back to our board meeting. We are on consent item number nine. Well, item agenda item number nine, consent items. So we'll ask our board members if they have any uh, items that they would like to pull. 9.1. Mrs. Mondrowski, 9.1. Ms. Harris? Same. 9.1, okay. Can I get a motion to move the rest in block? So moved. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Okay, 9.1. Do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? You go first. Okay, I just, I had a question about the, um, the first page. I don't have this stuff with me anymore. But, um, and I, I'm just now seeing that I did get a response that I haven't had a chance to read from um, Mr. What was your question? Mr. Hall. I've never seen a, um, a resolution like that before. Um, it looks like it's, is it pulling um, contracts or suggesting contracts or? Go ahead, jump right in there, Dr. Murphy. We, they wanted to reissue just because of the quality of the initial bids that we got, so that's why they uh, reissued the uh, the RFP. So, so each of those resolves is just pulling a contract of some sort or another. Right. Okay. Yep. And so we, we, even if we've already vo we but we haven't already voted on those contracts. No, these are just uh, RFPs. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I guess that's okay. Thanks. All right. Ms. Harris. Thank you. Although I don't see Mr. Hall back yet, but staff behind us that can answer questions. I know. Oh, <laughs> if you, you want. don't look like him. Okay. Um, yes, the question I had. I'm looking at um, three items on the on the uh, that procurement memo. Uh, item B one five six zero three off the lot new and used replacement vehicles for about two hundred fifty two hundred sixty thousand. Um, item 1085929, uh, 12 used cargo trucks for 350000 and item 7143.6, a trash compactor truck. Um, no surprise to anybody, I'm interested if any of these are electric or at least hybrid vehicles. No, they are not. And I reached out to um, DMO because that's where two of the three are coming from. They don't have the infrastructure in order to support electric or hybrid vehicles right now. Where is this that doesn't have the infrastructure? Department of Maintenance and Operations. And that's, that's what I was interested to know is um, why, when they say they don't have the infrastructure, since we are in the process as a county and as a system of installing it, charging, I assume you mean the charging stations? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Um, what, what their needs are that make um, nearby charging infrastructure inadequate so that we are, not, are purchasing diesel vehicles? So I can speak to that. Um, of course, we're in the middle of this great transformation of our bus fleet from diesel over to electric. Um, <clears throat> We have not undertaken at this point that same um, effort with our white fleet. Um, it's certainly something that we could look at, but would obviously cost money that is not currently in the budget. And so, you know, we would have to shift things around. Um, and the other problem is, you know, there are certain uh, vehicles like the trash compactor and stuff that they don't make necessarily electric for. Uh, and so this would be a, a larger conversation around if the board was interested in us, you know, shifting, um, you know, our white fleet and our other vehicles to an electric uh, fleet, then we would need to also, you know, build out the infrastructure, which would take time and money. Okay. So the the combination county and uh, other public space infrastructure, um, charging infrastructure, isn't not adequate or it's just not located where we need it? We really need our own dedicated chargers for, for these vehicles because, you know, we can't take the risk of using a public one where it might not be available or parking at, you know, a giant parking lot or, you know, whatever. Um, so if we were going to go in that direction, just to maintain continuity of operations, we would need to invest in our own infrastructure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. No other questions? Then can I get a motion to new move 9.1? So moved. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Okay, um, item 10 on our agenda is for information purposes only. Um, 
Can I get a motion to move items 11-1 one, one and 11-2 in block? So moved. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. That's unanimous. Item 11.3 is the approval of the committee work plans, which are posted on uh, board docs for special populations, the fiscal management committee, communication, and strategic plan. I need a motion to move these. So moved. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. That's unanimous. 11.4, do we have any new business items that you'd like to bring forward? Seeing none. 11.12, uh, excuse, excuse me, agenda item 12, informational purposes only. And our final item on our agenda, adjournment. Can I get a motion Ooh, to adjourn? Adjournment. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. We are adjourned.